Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'd like to now introduce our guest speaker for the month, and uh, that would be um, Lisa R. from Brooklyn, and she'll be sharing her experience, strength, and hope on steps one and two tonight. My name is Lisa I am an alcoholic. I feel very uh, privileged and honored to be here tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank your group, and in particular Mike and Kathy, for asking me to be here. Uh, I've been uh, fortunate to visit here for two different months' worth of speakers and uh, gotten a lot out of that experience, and I'm very happy to be here tonight and hopefully uh, for the next few weeks to share my experience and hope with you. Well, where do I begin? Uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, if they had to do a who's, who's who about me in AA, uh, my sobriety date is February 27th, 1988. I'm a member in reasonably good standing at my home group, uh, free, the Free Spirit Group in, in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. I say reasonably because I do not have hair high enough or fingernails long enough for the neighborhood, but they let me. <laughs> but because of the third tradition, they allow me in. Um, <laughs> I also don't have any cold chains, um, but uh, nonetheless, they do allow me in, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and the one thing I learned, the, the thing I learned at my first AA meeting was to learn how to laugh, and that's the biggest gift that I've ever received. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what landed me at the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I grew up in a big family. Uh, I'm number six out of seven children. Uh, it was pretty chaotic. Uh, quite frankly, how my mom survived not being in a wooly den is a testament to her and God. And uh, it was admitted to me later on in life that, you know, because I was number six out of seven, by the time I came around, if the knife I was running with wasn't sharp, it was okay. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of how it was. And... Uh, and my older brothers and sisters hated me for that. And I heard it daily how much I got away with. But I, I think I also got away with a lot because, like, they did a lot of stuff before I even got started. And um, I had an older sister who uh, was a junkie and a brother who was a liar, cheat, and a thief, and who um, I, I was embarrassed by every Friday afternoon in Catholic school because his was the first name read every week for detention. And then they would ask me, that's your brother? And I'd say, yes. You know? <laughs> and so following in their footsteps, um, you know, the stuff that I was pulling off, uh, I, I kind of got away with a lot just because there was a lot of chaos going on that had a lot more immediate severity. And, uh, and I, I learned early on, if you stay below the radar, it's okay. And I learned, I mean, I was young when I realized, hmm, you just do it when they're doing stuff nobody knows. You know, and I, I just kind of, that's how I went through life, staying below the radar to the best of my ability. And had I managed to pull off staying below the radar to the best of my ability, I wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, but it didn't, like, last. That that grace period was short. Um, but I kept trying. But it was short, and uh, there was a lot of drinking in my household, but that's not why I drank. Um, but uh, I only found out, actually, um, I think in my first year in AA, that not all family parties end with an ambulance or a police officer. Um, <laughs> I, I never knew a social drinker. Um, I, When I found out what they were, I was glad it never happened to me. Um, it doesn't sound appealing at all. And, uh, you know, I, I came from a very rough background. Uh, I was full of a lot of fear, a lot of inadequacies. They have, uh, you know, self, low self-esteem, whatever. Um, the reality is that um, I hated myself. I hated everything about me 
where I lived, what I did, who my family was. I was ashamed of everything about me. And uh, I don't know why I started out that way. It's just the way it was. And I think that's why I ended up an alcoholic. But that that's how I started out. And uh, I, I grew... I grew up uh, for the first 10 years of my life in a pretty rough housing project in uh, Astoria, Queens. And uh, kind of from like first grade on, when I was allowed out of the house by myself, uh, I came home every day with somebody's blood on me, either mine or someone else's. And not everybody who lived in the projects came home that way, but the way I was behaving, that's how I came home. I was so full of fear. When I would find myself in a situation, I struck out at them first because I always felt, well, if I get the first look in, I may walk away from it, you know. That wasn't like my own idea. That's what my dad taught me, you know, after the first time I came home with my blood all over me. You know, and he explained to me that, you know, uh, you you may find yourself in those situations. You, you, what you want to do is never walk away where they don't have a mark on them. You want them to show that they were in a fight with you. And then my mom, 10 minutes later, told me, nice girls don't fight. <laughs> I was living in a housing project. I didn't listen to her. Uh, I needed to survive, okay? And um, But long after I was at a housing project, I was still fighting people. Maybe not with my hands now, but I was fighting them in a more socially acceptable way. And uh, everything I did, the motivation was... Before drinking, everything I did was the motivation was to get people to like me or to leave me alone or whatever. And I found alcohol rather young. And uh, they uh, they actually tell me about a story that I don't recall, but it's not surprising that that's how I started, given how I ended up. They said that when I was five, my dad had given me some wine in a cup and he gave me like just a little taste, and it was the sweet wine that I probably wouldn't have been caught dead drinking at the first few years of my serious drinking, but <laughs> at the end I didn't really care. But uh, And I, I liked it, and I kept asking for more, and I kept asking for more, and my mother was telling him, no, 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 don't give her any more. <laughs> but my father gave me more, and, and they said that I fell asleep with my head on the cup on the table. And I don't remember this, but I'm not surprised by it. But um, that that was like at five, and then uh, the next time I got to drink that I remembered was at my sister's wedding. Once again, you know, I, I was the kid running around emptying the cans of the drinks, and nobody knew because a lot of other stuff was going on. That was yet another family party ended with both an ambulance and police. But uh, so my drinking some somebody's leftover beer was certainly not a concern, and uh, and then uh, I we moved to. Uh, from this housing project when I was 10, uh, well, actually, we moved because a few weeks before we moved, my my brother got into an altercation, and my father tried to help him out, and, and it ended up being about 200 people trying to kill my dad and two of his friends, and I was watching from the window, and I was scared, and uh, the cops wouldn't come because they didn't come to the housing project, and I, I thought my dad was going to get killed in front of me, and uh, it, it ended up, uh, he got pretty hurt, but he didn't get killed. But while this was going on, and this will give you a clue of who I was, there were a bunch of people uh, in my friend's house who were looking down at what was going on, and uh, I, I was making a joke to my friend. And she's like, your father's getting cream down there. What's so funny? And it was, it was all I had. It was the only tool I had. I didn't have, I couldn't pray. I couldn't ask for help. I was making fun of it. Um, I couldn't pray because by that age, I had already given up on the God idea. I had already a, a number, I mean, I, I was sent to Catholic school, um, went to church six days out of seven. And as a kid, I, you know, those first few years, I kind of liked it. And then I, I started, a lot of things were happening at home, a lot of things uh, where I was getting hurt a lot, and I just felt not protected by God. And a lot of bad things were happening, and I just felt like, it was, there's a God. He's not given too much of a care about what happens to me. And uh, and I, I lost faith at a very young age. And so I certainly didn't have the ability to pray when this thing was going on. And, uh, a couple of days after that, they shipped me off 
on vacation somewhere, and I, when I came back, we were in Pearl Park, Brooklyn, which at the time was uh, a big, a far cry from what I had grown up, which was in all these apartment buildings. Uh, we had a backyard. There was like a pear and an apple tree, and about half the people on our block were Hasidic Jews, but I thought they were Amish because um, cause I didn't know what a Hasidic Jew was. And and they didn't drive cars or use lights on the weekend, so I I, I just thought they were Amish, and um, we were uh, we were at the house maybe a week or two, and my landlord asked me how I like living there, so I love living in the country, you know. <laughs> it's pretty pathetic, but it's true. Um, but that just I mean it was just I mean I had no clue. I went through my entire life having no clue, and. Uh, about two years after we lived there, we, we moved to a new dimension called Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Um, which at the time, when I went into a grocery store, I had to point to things because I didn't speak Italian. Um, and uh, and I, I really, if I, if I didn't fit in in Borough Park, I certainly didn't fit in in Bensonhurst. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I very shortly after being there found... Um, I guess that crowd of people I had been warned about my whole life, and they were drinking every day before school. And uh, I had the option of hanging out with these people who were drinking every day before school or hanging out by me. So um, that wasn't too hard of a choice. And I have to be honest, like, even at that time, I was like, this doesn't seem too bright, just drinking in the morning before school for a moment. I had that thought. And I said, but if I don't drink when they pass that to me, they're not going to ask me back here tomorrow. So um, the first drink was on them. But something happened. Uh, the first couple of uh, swigs on, on, the, on the beer can, the, the warmth down my belly, and I changed from the new kid in town who really doesn't fit in to... I'm smart, funny, and attractive, and you're lucky to be hanging out with me. In seconds. In seconds. Who needs God? I have this. You know, I mean, I didn't think who needs God, but it was terrific. And uh, it was love at first sight. Uh, that particular drinking episode ended in me puking, uh, forgetting some things that happened, memory a little short. Found out later that's a blackout, but at the time I just forgot a couple of things that happened. And, you know, so from day one, alcohol and I didn't mix well. But I was out there the next morning waiting for them to get on the corner. I couldn't wait for them to get there. I was showing up earlier and earlier every day, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and I was kind of pissed I didn't see him on the weekends. But, um, that's, that's what started me in, uh, and I had consequences for my drinking early in. I got caught drinking at school. Um, I, I was, I don't know, some teacher's monitor. And uh, me and a friend of mine were drinking this homemade wine. Oh, avoid it all costs. Um, it's like romanticized in the Italian culture, this homemade wine, but um, not if you didn't grow up with it. And um, But we drank it anyway because it got you bombed. And... Uh, we, we thought we were really smart because we had closed the door to the teacher's room we were working in, and we were, we didn't realize, like, the shade was up, and they were watching us from the classroom across. So I wasn't the brightest drunk um, by any stretch. Um, and and so I got suspended. Uh, so I, I had to tell my parents, well, I wasn't going to school for five days. So I told them I got into a fight. That was certainly believable. My mother said, you have to stop. My father said, did you win? You know, so, off, and I continued, and uh, and I kept drinking, and, uh, and and I got into trouble, and I remember uh, there was one incident, uh, I was like 14, and I got really bombed one night, uh, so bombed that my drunk friends decided I needed to be walked home, which was interesting, and, uh, but they left me, you know, at the door and ran, as we always do, and, uh, I was having a tough time getting the key in the door for a long time, they tell me. Apparently, I was out there for 20 to 30 minutes when my father finally had had enough. 
but by that time I was already leaning into the door because I needed to get close to that hole to see it, and I fell in. And uh, and my mom was upset, and my father yelled at me, but he had been drinking that night, and I said, how is it any different from what you're doing? Um, I have a thing on my tooth here from that question. And, um, and I was grounded for a month. So I ran away the next day. <laughs> and, uh, but I ran to my sister's house. That wasn't particularly successful. She shipped me back. But it got me out of being grounded for a month. I'm not so alert, I guess. And, and I just continued to go on and on. And, uh, and I learned a couple of tricks that if I keep my grades up, I get a little part-time job so I'm not asking them for money. They really left me alone. And I just had to learn that when I got like that sloppy, stay at my friend's house. I wasn't going to stop drinking. Like, don't get ridiculous, okay? And uh, that's all I had. And uh, I delved shortly into other matters, which we won't go into in detail, but by the time I was 16, I was done with those other matters. And I was like, oh, just drinking. And uh, and quite frankly, um, because of the track record of my older siblings, even my parents knew I was drinking, they weren't too concerned because at least she's not doing drugs, you know. And I got away with murder because of that. Well, not physically, but um, a lot of things you shouldn't really get away with. And uh, and I kept drinking. And uh, I made it, made it through uh, high school, uh, kind of in spite of myself. I had a habit of taking um, Wednesdays off to break up the week, and um, and uh, that kind of got expanded. And uh, you know, I, I ran into somebody in a 12-step meeting who I knew from that period, and he was telling me about our high school reunion. And I said, I didn't go to your high school. I went to New Utrecht. He said, No, you went to FDR. I said, No, I was a student of New Utrecht High School. And he said, but you were at our campus every day. I said, that's where my friends were, you know. <laughs> I went to school a mile away. But, um, you know, so I, I I didn't really recall being out that much, but apparently I was. Uh, <laughs> that was like when I was sober 10 years and I didn't know the truth yet, you know. So um, it slowly gets revealed. Um, at any rate, uh, I kept drinking. I uh found a hostage, took a husband, whatever you want to call it. Um, let me just back up for one thing. When I was 17, I, I was in my first year of college, and uh, I had my first break from school, and it was a break from work. I had like a whole week off. And I had things I needed to get done and things I said I was going to do, and I had a, a buddy of mine that we had plans for what we were going to do every day. We were going to go here, go here. And we got in the car, and we went to these different towns to visit. But whenever we would get there, I said, hey, let's stop off for a drink. And then we would spend the next whatever number of hours in some bar and wherever, and then they'd close the bar and we went back to Brooklyn. And I realized, you know, now that we could have been drinking longer if we hadn't gone to those other towns because, you know, it was just another bar. But, but I could say that I had been to such and such and such and such. And then it was Sunday night all of a sudden. And I, I had to, I was due back at college and I had a paper due. Ugh. This is horrible. I think maybe all those days out drinking might have been not a good idea. You know, maybe my father's right. Maybe I do have a drinking problem. Nah, I know this. I had no structured time. I have a free time problem. I need to better manage my time. It's the free time. If I don't have too much free time, I could drink a little and be okay. It's a free time problem. That's 17, the first moment of clarity. I didn't come into Alcoholics Anonymous until I was 26 years old. Um, there were many similar incidents. Maybe they're right. Maybe this isn't working. No, it's my husband, it's my boss, it's my parents. They were dysfunctional. Um, I can't help it, I'm a product of. And I would move on. And uh, and I kind of had a, uh, 
kind of going theme in my head. I would walk through life, um, and I kind of felt like like a car on the track of the car wash. There comes a point where you put it in neutral. Well, now you got to see what happens. Oop, here goes the car. Hey, they can throw some hot wax at me. Oh, crap. And stuff would come at me, and that was called life. And I had nothing to do with it. I was on this little track, and this is horrible. Look at all this stuff that's happening to me. Oh, little me. The world's biggest victim. I was beyond, beyond angry. When at one of my early AA meetings, somebody talked about being a victim their whole life. And I was like, yeah. And he said, there are no victims, only volunteers. I hated that guy for about two years. I was praying for that guy. Oh, it just didn't stop. And, um, because he would say it over and over again, you know? Him and the guy with the pickle and the cucumber, okay? I wasn't too thrilled with that analogy either. Um, I just kept, I kept drinking and I kept moving on and, uh, you know, in line with keeping people at bay, I managed to get out of college with a very good grade point average. Uh, I got a great job on Wall Street. Um, I'm already married six months, by the way, and, um, you know, I'm making more money than I can count. And I'm this, like, little kid who, like, grew up in the projects. That's who's, like, in my suit every day. I'm like, what am I doing here? These people have a clue. What am I doing here? You know? But there was this, also that sense, of, like, like, that Bill talk, I have arrived. I didn't have those words then, but there was a sense of, like, look at me where I am. And I, I always kind of thought, like, they were going to find out, but um, that I didn't belong there. But um, I just... I managed to show up, and I uh, I work hard, and uh, well, you know what you have to do if you work hard. You need to play hard to keep it balanced. And um, I'm a, I'm literally a newlywed, not coming home every night. She didn't really understand me, and uh, I had these new friends. I had this new job that I had to make relationships and connections at at the bar. Um, and every day, I would wake up kind of feeling a little sick and a little nauseous and a little nervous. And I'd be like, I really got to cut back. I got to slow this down. And I'd go to work, and I'd rough it through the day. And around 4.30, I'd start to call. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? I'd find some poor thirsty blob, and off we would go. And, you know, and I'd start with the A-list the people I actually could tolerate their presence for some part of the evening. That's the A-list. And then I'd be like, oh, okay. Well, there's the people I don't hate entirely. Let me call them now. And then it's like, I hate that guy. Maybe he's going to the bar. Hey, Joe, what are you doing? I'm going to the bar. Great. At 10 o'clock, I thought he was blank. I won't say it, right, because it's being taped. And at 4.30, when nobody else is drinking, I want to go hang out with Joe. And uh, and that's what I did. And uh, my, my drinking got worse because I had more money. And, uh, <laughs> and an expense account. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the drinking got worse. And, uh, and my husband had some... I think we talk about it, unrealistic expectations of people. He wanted me home after work, nightly, for dinner with him. <sighs> that wasn't working out so good. Because um, I was just stopping for a few. Or, uh, yeah, I stopped for an hour and have a few drinks. And there was a woman... Uh, who uh, was no longer with us, who was at my, my home group, uh, a woman, Marion Cleary, some of you may have heard of, and she used to say that alcoholics can't count or uh, tell time. And that's certainly true. And uh, and the night would start going, and, you know, I would call and say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out with my friends, and uh, I'm going to be home in blah, blah, blah. And he'd be like, listen, if you're really just going to be out all night, tell me now so I can do something. 
but I didn't want him going nowhere. I wanted him there when I got home. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'll be home. I'm going to take the 730. Uh, just, you know, I didn't live in the suburbs. I live um, in Brooklyn. I took the subway. There is no schedule. If there's a schedule, it's certainly not posted. Uh, I would make up these times I was going to get on the train. And, um, and uh, I would call him every couple or whatever periods of time, and he would start to get angry and be a little curt and cold on the phone. And he'd even say something mean. And I'd say, well, if you're going to treat me like this, I'm not coming home. <laughs> and there out I'd be. And uh, in the never-ending search for yet another ATM machine, that might give me some more cash. And, uh, and again, I was doing nothing but drinking at this point, and I was spending hundreds of dollars a night. So that, you know, I, I had uh, appearances to keep up. I had to eat in the right restaurants, have the right wine with this particular thing. And when this night would start off very, very top shelf. And uh, if only it ended there, it would be nice. But I would find myself in a, there were a couple of favorite spots. Uh, there was an after-hours club uptown because I liked the music they played there, and I liked dancing there. That's why I was there. And then um, there was the convenient place down by um, South Ferry, a, play, a very nice establishment called uh, Cassidy's Liquid Assets. Um, it was helpful because... Um, it was near the ferry that my drinking partner needed to get home, and I could always get a cab there. So that was a good place. Shots are a dollar. Good beer on tap. That's where I ended the night, you know. Started off with a $200 dinner. I ended up with a five-hour, $20 bar, bar tab. You know, was that, I mean, I saw, like, top to bottom in one night. And uh, there were many nights where I stayed in town through the whole night. And that was getting expensive because now the next morning I'm like buying clothes, trying to wash up in the bathroom at work, you know. <sighs> but there is a solution. <laughs> I found the gym near my job. It's open 24 hours. And I bought a locker there and I kept um, shirts, nylons, shoe polish because I was always scuffing my shoes somehow. Um, and so now, no matter where I was, I could make it there before I got to the office and, you know, at least have clean clothes. I mean, the booze is pouring out of me, and I stink like whatever. And, uh, but I'm doing okay because I got clean shirt. And, uh, whatever. Um, and I, I kept drinking, and, uh, I started to have some problems at home. <laughs> There's a surprise. And, uh. I'm starting to have difficulty now getting to work, like when they want me there, five days a week. And uh, I developed uh, MFD, Monday-Friday disease, and then my work week started shrinking. And, um, and yet somehow I kept getting promoted. <laughs> I, 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 like, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. And, and I talked about it in the book that, you know, uh, you know, we're resourceful, and, you know, I would come in for three days and do, like, six days of work because I was guilty and this and that. So I, I was always, you know, meeting my deadlines and, you know, and kind of looking at those people who showed up every day on time, plug and say, fool, fool, you need to live my life. They're going home every night watering their garden, playing with their kids, going to a soccer game. Uh, I was making more than a lot of them, and I couldn't barely afford my rent because of the way I was living. And I thought they were the fool. And uh, some things started happening for me. I, uh, I believed that I had developed a nervous condition because now every morning I'm waking up shaky. <sighs> 
you know, there's a couple of people in my family line who have some mental illness, so I figured, oh, I got that. And uh, I got really nervous. So I said, you know, maybe uh, maybe I should give up the caffeine. So I stopped drinking coffee, and I cut out chocolate, which was not easy. And I started drinking uh, caffeine-free, whatever, 7-Up or something. I was still shaking in the morning. I mean, I literally, I, I could have just put the pencil in the sharpener without plugging it in. It would have been fine. But, um... But I didn't drink in the morning because that wasn't a good sign. So um, I, did, I would just kind of like ride out, you know, the achy, breaky spider machine. And then I would uh, have a few pops at lunch, go back to work, and then uh, off I went. And uh, I started to develop some really irrational fears. Um, which I started to be afraid of wide open spaces, bridges, heights, tunnels. Um, I had to take a train that was elevated into a tunnel under the river to go to my job on the 42nd floor where the back of my office was all glass looking at the East River. Lovely mornings. And uh, I started... Uh, to go for professional help because I got some mental problems and they thought I had a Valium deficiency. So, because I certainly wasn't telling them about my drinking, hello, because, uh, you know, that's one thing holding me together. It's the one thing I'm looking forward to at the end of each day. It's my saving grace. I'm not talking about that. So now I'm taking prescribed medication in a way that's not prescribed. And uh, I've never been more physically sick in my life with that combination because oh, this medicine isn't working out. So I gave up the medicine. I didn't give up the drinking. Uh, the slip back, I had had, was going for my license when I was like 20. And I was drinking one night, got into a car accident, um, and I realized that drinking and driving wasn't working, so I gave up driving. I only got my license, what was it, four, three years ago? I didn't trust myself sober, but that's okay. Uh, you know, when I would find things clash with my drinking, I would analyze it deeply for three seconds and say, that's got to go. So... I've changed a few jobs, I moved, I cut off friends, I did what I had to do, just don't get between me and my alcohol. And uh, like I said, I started going for professional help. And uh, I, I would go there, I would not disclose the full truth, and I would, even with that, some things would get stirred up, I couldn't handle the feelings, so I would go to the bar. And I understand that therapy works better, um, subsequent I found out it works better, if you tell them the truth and don't drink immediately thereafter. But um, in spite of that behavior, certain truths were brought to me. And I was in some pretty bad relationships that I was in a bad marriage. Uh, I was a lot of why it was a bad marriage, but it was bad for other reasons as well. But I'm here to focus on me. And, uh, and I had some pretty wacky friendships. And, uh, and so I... Even with all the stuff, I was hearing some stuff, and I got rid of those things. And I changed my job because I had a bad relationship with the boss. And I changed this, and I changed that, and I'm still miserable. I went there one day, and I said, I changed everything. I'm still miserable. I need help. I said, well, what else is there to change? Did you leave anything out? Home, family, money, blah, blah, blah. No. Nothing. I got nothing. Nothing left. All right, well, if there is something, she says, I'm sure it'll surface. So then I decided to talk about, you know, my daily tale of woe, fight with another boss. And I'm talking about an argument I had with my boss that day, and she was, you know, you were clearly wrong. 
I says, yeah, I was in a kind of a crotchety mood, you know, I was a little hungover and blah. And like, as I said it, like, oh. <laughs> oh. So no, I say that. Maybe she didn't catch it. What'd you say? She said I was a little hungover. Really? Is that a common occurrence? Happens sometimes. And I'm thinking inside, whatever I drink, but I'm not telling her. So she started asking me, now, for the record, I've, I've been with this woman five years every week, crying to her about my, you know, wretched little life. And now she's starting to ask me what I feel a little too personal questions. How much do you drink? How often do you drink? What happens to you when you drink? This is a woman who two years before that, I talked to her about being sexually molested as a child. That was okay. Don't talk to me about my drinking. Please. I said, to her, that's not my problem. Can we move on? And she goes, what do you mean that's not your problem? And I said what I really believe to be true. I was like, that's my escape valve. I can't take that. I mean, that's the thing, like, you know, things get stressful. Let's have a few pops. Everything's okay. Because I had this, like, monitor in my head, like, when things would come on my horizon, when that car wash would shoot hot wax at me, ah, there's nothing a couple of drinks can't cure. You know, that's how I went through life. And now this woman's trying to, like, grill me. Three questions. She was grilling me about my drinking. But as, as happens, sessions do end, and I got out of there. I went to the bar. And I went back there next week. And she's starting to talk to me about the drinking again. I said, we discussed that last week. We need to talk about my real problem. And, you know, I thought that would be enough. Because whenever I thought about my drinking, I'd think about it a little bit, decide that wasn't the problem, and move on. So I thought she would have that same reaction. Another 45 minutes of talking about my drinking. And I told her, I, I think I can control it. And she said, well, well, what you explained to me about your drinking, I think you're past the point of being able to control it. There may have been a time, but you've long passed that. And I looked at her, and I got the first telling of the pickle and the cucumber. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and she kept talking to me and talking to me about my drinking. You know, uh, there was a God, so the session ended, and uh, I walked out of there and said, she doesn't know a thing. For five years, I was running there every Wednesday night because she was going to help me. Now she doesn't know a thing. I stopped going. She doesn't know anything. But she had planted a couple of seeds in my head, and every time I picked up a drink, there was like her face. <laughs> Talking to me, how much do you drink? What happens to you when you drink? What are the consequences when you drink? Die, blank, die. <laughs> She's not even there. She's not there, and I'm yelling at her. My first sponsor taught me to only argue with people physically present. But I needed to learn that in AA. Um, she, she ruined my drinking. So now I'm going to control my drinking. She's wrong, I can control my drinking. So I start to control my drinking. Not. And shortly into my experiment of controlling my drinking, I identified that, you know, once I start drinking, I can't control it. So I'm going to give that up. And I tried many options under that, which I won't bore you with. But I, even I had to concede later to my innermost self <laughs> that once I start drinking, I can't stop. So now I have to figure out which days I could get away with starting drinking. I could do this. I have control. And I'd leave my house. I'm not drinking today. I'm not drinking today. And I'd make it through lunch. And the way I made it through lunch is I stopped going out to lunch because you can't go out to lunch and not drink, apparently. I found that out. So now I start having no lunch. And now I'm 
not drinking, I'm not drinking, it's 4.30, I will not call anyone, just go straight home. But there were quite a few drinking establishments between the front of my office and where I picked up the train. So on the successful nights, that meant a two-block walk was like a five-block walk to get there because I, I, I couldn't physically pass one of my bars and not go in. Okay, I could do this. But there were nights where I'd end up literally at the bar going, why are you coming here? I'm here now. And if I made it through the five-block gauntlet to get to the train, there was a few other tests to pass. That, because um, two trains came at the station, and if the N train came, that meant I could, that was the train that goes to my neighborhood, and there was no bar between that train stop and my house. Great. Going home, not drinking. If the R train came, that goes to Bay Ridge where there's three bars per block. It was meant to be. There are three, there are three stations between Wall Street and my home where the N train and the R train across the platform from one another. So there were three more opportunities. The R trains there waiting with the doors open. It was meant to be. I could no longer, I had to even to myself say, I can't pick when I'm drinking. Holy, mm hmm And there was a, at the time, there was kind of a big homeless problem uh, in New York, and I would kind of look with envy at them. They gave up the fight. It's over. I'm fighting every day. And I remember getting on the train in the morning, and there would be those, uh, posters for great adventure and I'd be like great adventure you don't know a great adventure my life is a great adventure I don't know when I leave my house what's going to happen to me today um, and it was true it wasn't a good great adventure but it was a great adventure and uh, something happened I uh, there was a night I wasn't going to drink and uh, and I went to a party at a colleague's house and I was supposed to sleep over and I was very uncomfortable because she was the only person I knew, and I'm around new people, and I'm feeling those feelings of uselessness and self-pity and low self-esteem, and I'm not enough. I was over here in uh, Maplewood. I don't know if that's close or far. I'm not good with that stuff. And um, at 12.01, I was like, it's a new day. Praise God. And I started drinking. And, um, you know, I, I had to do that thing we do. I had to make up for lost time. So I got really loaded rather quickly and passed out. Fortunately, like, up in the bedroom where I was supposed to. And uh, I remember not being able to remember the words to the Lord's Prayer that night. And thinking, because even though I wasn't going to church and didn't believe in God, the nuns did a good job. And I said it every night when I didn't pass out. And I was like, I don't feel good. I'm going to die on my puke. And I didn't pray I'm going to hell. <laughs> And uh, and I got up the next day, and I went home. And my sister-in-law was there giving, she was in labor rather loudly, and I was hung over. So not a good combination. And uh, she kept calling me into the bedroom to hold her hand. <laughs> and it would seem she would quiet down and ask for me. And when I'd go in there and hold her hand, she'd wail right in my ear and I knew that I had killed somebody in a prior life and that's why this was happening to me and, uh, and this went on for hours and we went back and forth to the hospital a couple of times and they said she wasn't ready and I am dying of that kind of thirst and there's nothing around that's what I said and uh <laughs> And we go back to the hospital for like the fifth time. And uh, and they tell us that the, the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck, and that's why he's not been able to come out. And they rush her in for an emergency C-section. And my brother says to me, they're going to let me go in there and go home. I went to the bar. I showed up home the next day at 11, not knowing if my sister-in-law was alive or if I had a niece or nephew. 
and uh, come in and I, I ask my mom, how's everything? She's like, you care. Uh, I care, but not enough, apparently. And, uh, and I said, no, I really care what happened. And fortunately, everybody was okay. But my brother probably needed me to be there. I should have been waiting in the waiting area for whenever he got out. Because that's what I do now when things like that happen. But I wasn't capable. I was never, I, I never felt lower than I did that day. But I drank that night. I wanted to stop drinking and I couldn't stop. I wanted desperately to stop drinking and I could not stop. I knew it was just a matter of time before I was out there with my own shopping cart. It was just a matter of time. Things were slipping. I was getting in trouble at work. I was getting in the frying pan all the time. So I went back to that therapist and I told her, I can't stop drinking. She said, I can't help you. <laughs> Why did you tell me? I was better off when I didn't know like it mattered and she said oh no no no! I can't help you get a load of this but Alcoholics Anonymous can help you she might as well hit the gavel sentence me to 20 years um, and I said oh I don't know if it's that extreme of a problem <laughs> I was miserable I was that, I mean I was like dirt under your shoe but Alcoholics Anonymous that's a stretch I mean I didn't know anything about AA except what I read in Ann Landers and, you know, whenever I filled out one of those quizzes, I always seemed to fail even when I lied. But I innately knew that when you went there, you don't drink anymore. Yeah. Ever. One day at a time. What's that nonsense? It's always today, hello, I got that. Um... But, uh, but I guess, you know, I, I don't know. She said, this, she says, you know I can't help you. If I could have helped you, I would have helped you years ago. You need to go. No, no, you go. You know, she sent me, and I came. She went to my first AA meeting with me. Ooh, I have a God. I didn't know it yet. I have a God. And uh, my second meeting, I showed up at Free Spirit. And uh, they opened the door, and, they kept, and they, I was out in the cold deciding whether to go in or not. And somebody said to me, I don't know what you're trying to make up your mind about out here, but it's really cold, so why don't you come inside and do that? How does he know I'm making up my mind? <laughs> he is tall, and he is fierce looking. He goes, hi, I'm Vinny. What's your name? Lisa. I don't believe we've seen you here before, young lady. <laughs> You'll never see me again. <laughs> and he spent uh, the next 15 minutes introducing me to every female in the room. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do I look like a lesbian? You know, I was recently separated, and there were men in the room. What are you doing to me, Timmy? And he gave me a half a cup of coffee. And he made me take all these telephone numbers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then there's this little five-foot Italian lady. Uh, what's, can I have your number? I'm thinking my real number? Well, the one I give guys at bars. Um, I said, I may come back here one more time. I have to give her a number. I'll give her my work number, and whenever she calls, I'm busy. So I give her my work number. And I forget about it. Then the meeting ends, and I'm putting my coat on. Here comes Big Vinny. Where are you going? Home. Oh, no, no, we have a second meeting. Take your coat off. Relax. I really need to get home. You really need to take your coat off. Oh take my coat off and it's one of these meetings where you break up into tables and talk about how you feel 
I was married to somebody for six years and he never knew. Why would I tell you? You know? <laughs> and I make it through that rather unpleasant experience. And I put the coat on. I said, Tola, where are you going? Is there another meeting? Says, no, 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 it's late. So I'm going to go home. We're going to the diner. Have a nice time. You're coming with us. I really need to get up early for work in the morning. If we were going to the bar, you'd be coming. Come on. Thank you so much. And uh, I went to the diner, and we leave there, and I'm thinking, I'm putting the coat on. He goes, where are you going? At this point, you know what I said? I don't know, Vinny. You tell me. No, you go home. We'll drive you home. I said, oh, I only live 10 blocks from here. Get in the car. This is Benson Hurst. He's Vinny. It's the Lincoln Continental. I got in the car. One of them two-door jobbies, because they don't do four-door Lincolns in Benson Hurst. And I'm in the back seat. And I'm in front of my house. Praise the Lord. But they won't stop. Yang, 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 yang. And I'm thinking, this is, it was the twilight zone I walked into. Not Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm never getting out of this car. Anxiety's filling me. I, I will, I'll cut off my left arm if you let me out of the car. Finally. Have a good night. I'm out of the car. Grabs me. 6.30 tomorrow, right there. We're picking you up for a meeting. Thank you. I close the door. I'm moving. 6.30, I'm out there waiting. Because the hand of AA was put out to me. And I found a sponsor. And uh, and she, she was that lady who took my number. She called me that next day. And got me to go to an AA meeting at lunch instead of the bar. And uh, I didn't remember what she looked like, but I already hated her, which meant you knew she was going to become my sponsor. Um, and uh, we talked about her drinking history. I don't care. Why? I don't know you. Why are you telling me this stuff about you? You know, when somebody long enough tells you about them, you have the guilt to tell them a little something about you. So now I have to tell her. And then uh, she got me to read the book and point out alcoholism and the, uh, the allergy and the craving and where it describes the alcoholic that once they begin drinking, they cannot stop. That was me like eight years ago. She was, then you're a real alcoholic. Show me where that Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know what I am now. There's some hope for me. And they told me I needed a higher power. Oh, that's a guy I haven't really been talking to. Um, I don't know if he exists. Like, I mean, I know he exists, but does he exist for me? I don't know. But everyone who's in AA that I'm going to and happy is talking about higher power sponsored steps. Oh, well, you know what? I had this a, a moment of clarity like on my own. I don't need help being miserable. I was doing that pretty well on my own. I'm not going to talk to those people. I'm going to talk to those people with that sparkle in their eye. And, like, no matter what's going on, they're seeing the brighter side of it, and they're getting through it. And, uh, and I realized I needed a higher power, but I didn't really have one. And I told her, I, I, I do concede that I need a higher power. I know I need it. But I don't have one. She says, that's not a requirement for prayer. Pray. Oh. On my knees? If, if she said, that's what I do, you can do whatever you want, just start praying. Ask to be kept sober, and if you make it through the day sober, thank them. But don't lie to them. If you ask them to be kept sober, you better have a plan of what meeting you're making, whether you're calling me that day, whether you're reading literature that day. She went through this list of things like, if I pray to be kept sober in the morning, don't lie, I better have a plan of action for the day. Okay, I can do this. 
But I was living with my brother at the time, who was one of my running partners, and I wouldn't want to be caught like crazy. Let, you know, three weeks earlier, missing a shoe, buttons off of my shirt, puking in the bowl, that's okay. On my knees, praying to God, I closed the door to my bedroom and pulled down the shade and prayed. And, uh, you know, she had explained some things to me that I didn't need to understand God to believe in him. I didn't need to understand God to turn my will and my life over to him. But there was a, I wasn't one of those people who went immediately from two to three. That was not my experience. I wish it were. But there was a, a couple of months struggle for me because I'm like retarded or something. I don't know. Um, I know I need it, and yet I'm not going there. And uh, I remember her telling me that you are an alcoholic. You know that, right? And I'm like, yeah. Because you know you have no power, right? Yeah. You know you need a power. Yeah. So the next thing, I, ah, she said, okay, I guarantee you, as an alcoholic, the day is going to come where you're going to want to drink. You have no mental defense against that. Self-knowledge will not help you. That will be the day you cannot get another alcoholic on the phone. You will not be able to make it to a meeting. You better have a God then, and you better turn your life over then. Yeah. Okay. There are times in my sobriety where I sound like Rain Man. Yeah. Okay. That means I hear what you say, I'll think about it for three, three or four weeks, and maybe implement it. Yeah. Okay. But for the next few weeks, all I'm going to dwell on is that suggestion you gave me I don't want to take. And if I've learned anything from coming to AA, if my first reaction to a suggestion is a desire to vomit, I need to do it. Okay? <laughs> and the day came. I was, uh, I was on a new job. That's another thing I changed before the year was up uh, against suggestion. I also had gotten changed jobs, got divorced, walked out of graduate school. We'll talk about that some other time. But apparently those suggestions didn't mean anything to me. In fact, I made those changes without even talking to my sponsor about it. And uh, she actually didn't even know I was in graduate school. That was how honest and open I was to her at the time. A year later, I told her that, you know, one night when I was counting days, I, I was in class and I just walked out because I knew I needed a meeting. She was like, when were you in graduate school? This is my sponsor, okay? All right. So the day comes, um, I'm sent out on a job, and I'll be quick because I know we need to close the meeting. And uh, and it's a new place. I don't know where I'm going. But when I get there, I realize that the name of the company isn't the name they do business as. And when I get there, it's a bar restaurant. I used to drink them all the time. Oof. This is not good. But I, I have to go. So I go in, and uh, they ask me, do you want to work at the bar or you want to work in the office? I think I'll work in the office today. <laughs> I got to give myself a shot, right? But all I could do is hear the music and smell the booze. I want to drink. I want to drink. I got to call Annie. I don't have my book. Oh God! Let me go to the ladies' room. I go in, go in there. People are snorting coke. Oh, this isn't good. So I go back to the office, and I go, "What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do?" And it came back to me what she said, as it always does, just when I need it. I got on my knees and I prayed for something I didn't know or understand, and I asked for help. And five minutes later, the desire to have a drink left me. I continued to work there for six or seven more hours, walked out of there a free woman. Uh, taking my third step was not a problem after that. Um, thank you very much for listening to me tonight. This has been great for me. I hope it's been great for you. like now to introduce our guest speaker for the month, uh, Lisa R. from Brooklyn. She will be speaking on steps three, four, and five tonight. So here's Lisa. Good evening. My name is Lisa Reese, and I am an alcoholic. I brought some people in there behaving badly in the back. Um, <laughs> so they must be good friends of mine. Um, uh, once again, I'd like to thank this group for uh, 
asking you to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. Uh, I have a lot of respect for this group, and I'm very happy to be a part of the process here. Thank you very much. Um, you know, before I get talking on uh, 3, 4, and 5, I just want to relate an experience I had this morning. Thank you. Uh, I had been complaining to a coworker that I believe I'm traveling too much for work. And after I finished complaining, I was like, you really need to stop complaining. And I got on a plane, and the stewardess recognized me. Uh, remembered what I drink, and uh, asked me how the retreat in Denver was. So, um, <laughs> you know, had that experience happened uh, while I was drinking alcohol, I would have proposed marriage to her that she remembered my drink. I would have found out her schedule and figured out how to always be on her plane. But uh, just kind of felt the need to share that. It was very amusing to me. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes I'm not complaining. I'm just telling the truth. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to share that. Uh, at any rate, uh, I shared last week about uh, how I've had a, uh, an, a spiritual battle kind of my whole life. And uh, to back up a little bit, uh, before I came into AA, uh, my life was circling the drain but I didn't know it. But one of my two best friends who no longer hung out with me because I was out of control was calling me on almost a weekly basis to check on me and what I was up to. And finally one day she just said, you know, I've had enough of these polite conversations. Your, your life is circling the drain. I think you're past the loss. You're out of control. You need help. And I don't know how to help you, but you need help. Why don't you come back to church with me? Oh, yeah, that'll help but I went, <laughs> and uh, it had been, you know, minus uh, weddings and funerals, it had been a long time since I'd been in church for a plain old mass, and I didn't remember much, and I wasn't sure I wanted to be there, but it kind of felt okay, and uh, well, I just followed the little ladies in front of me, because I forgot when he was supposed to get up and down, and the nuns with the clackers were long gone, so I had to watch the old ladies. <laughs> But, you know, it's amazing. Uh, you know, the second time I went back there, I had it all down because I, had used, I used to go to the church six days a week as a kid. And uh, the, the church part wasn't doing much for me, but um, I had one friend that still cared, so I didn't want to not go. And a couple of times I went there straight from uh, an after-hours club, not smelling so good. But I think I went there, like, almost every Sunday for about a year before I landed in AA. And uh, I couldn't keep up with what was going on, but I would just say, I need help. I didn't know it was drinking, but I knew I needed help. And I, that's the only prayer I could, like, get utter out. I need help. I need help. I said it inside because I knew if I kept saying it outside, they'd lock me up. But that's all I could say. And uh, it was the one hour out of the week I didn't have an anxiety attack. It was the one hour out of the week I didn't want to drink. It was the one hour out of the week that maybe it will be okay. But ten minutes after I was out of there, it was all, all over. And, um, you know, this is my friend Amory, and uh, I got help. I got into AA. And, uh, and I kept going to church. I really didn't care for church, but it felt like a good place. And, uh, you know, I, I shared with you last week about how I – you know, finally came to truly admit, concede to my innermost self of my alcohol problem. And how, in spite of that, knowing I was powerless and that I needed the power, I was having a tough time, even though I'm going to church every Sunday. So I was definitely hurting. And, uh, and I just kept, uh, I kept, I just kept going to church, to AA, and I, I didn't know what, what was going on, and, uh, and I kept, Hearing everybody say that, you know, without a third step, you're dead. You know, it seemed like whatever I didn't have, without it, I was going to be dead. And uh, inventory, a higher power, third step, uh, make amends. So I'm thinking I'm doomed. And uh, and I had uh, my my home group was free spirit, and uh, 
it was February of uh, 88 when I got there, and it just seemed like within the next few weeks of when I got there, there was about 15 of us who all came in around the same time, and we referred to ourselves as the class of 88. We weren't too bright, but we were a class, <laughs> okay? And we, we, we were the uh, fellowship junkies, you know, and uh, we got to the meeting early, we left the meeting late, we went to the horrible diner across the street, uh, we drank a lot of coffee and didn't know why we couldn't sleep at night, um, we complained to each other about the suggestions our sponsors had given us the night before, uh, you know, all that good fellowship stuff. And, and yet some of them started to get better. And they were actually following those suggestions instead of complaining about them. And they started to get the stuff that I wanted, but I couldn't have because I didn't have a higher power. I really didn't. I had wanted a higher power, but I didn't have one yet. And uh, I just felt like I was falling to the back of the class, which was an uncomfortable place for me because... I'm a competitive person by nature, or at least I was at that time. And uh, well, I imagine I am today, but hide it better. But um, uh, at any rate, uh, I'm losing the spiritual race. I didn't know there was one. I made my own. You know, like I'm falling behind. Uh, it's kind of insane, but I really felt like I'm losing, and they're going to leave me behind. And, you know, the, the reality is, had I not caught up eventually, they would have left me behind. Because I would have drank or I would have been, you know, miserably sober. Whereas, you know, what I see with some other people, stark raving sober. Um, you know, whatever it is. And uh, But you can't go faster than your own pace. <laughs> like, I don't care how much you want something. If you aren't there here, it, it ain't happening. And I kept trying to force it. And I... And I uh, and I had some inklings of a higher power because my sponsor had me praying every morning. She said that the belief in a higher power wasn't a requirement and all that. And and now my friends are doing their fourth steps. I'm like, oh, man, I'm a loser, you know. And I can't have this. So I said to my sponsor, i got to do a fourth step. My friends are doing their fourth step. She's like, you don't even have a second step. Keep coming. And uh, she told me, don't do it. I got to do it now. <laughs> she told me, don't. Well, I didn't have a second step. I most certainly didn't have a third step. So what I was writing about, God only knows. And I was re I, I got to so I listened to what their sponsors told them, because, you know, we were still razzing on our sponsors and designer. And... And I'm reading in how it works. I'm like, Mrs. Jones, he's a nut. She is. So what? This is nuts. Close the book. I didn't understand the columns. I wasn't ready to understand the columns because I was nowhere near it. Uh, you know, I, I was born in America, read English, couldn't understand it. Because I, I just wasn't ready yet. That didn't stop me from trying. So uh, one of my friends got a list of, I don't know, 78 character defects, and you're supposed to do these things with, so I start doing it. Nobody told me to do this. I just started doing it because I don't want to fall behind. And I would start for five minutes. Uh, I'd be like, oh, my house is dirty. I've got to clean the house. Oh, those curtains need to be rehung. You know, there's many things you could say about Lisa Risi, but um, no one will ever walk into my home, drunk or sober, and say, maybe Martha does live here. Nobody will ever say that. But in the period that I was not ready to do a fourth step in trying, I'm cleaning up the house. And I got very agitated. And as I'm writing out resentments that I didn't understand, I'm getting ready to go get the bat and kill these people. And so something told me that this probably wasn't right, that I shouldn't be wanting to kill people. So I talked to my sponsor about it. She says, what are you doing? She says, you don't have a second step. Go back. She know. So I go, I'm at a third step meeting in the Bay Ridge group one night, and it's a, they're talking about it. And I talk about how I don't understand what it means, but it's one of the women there with like 900 years of sobriety says, well, Missy, if you don't know the third, go back to the second. 
They're all saying the same thing. They all need to die. I hate them. There's a secret they're not telling me. Why am I not getting this? Well, I just wasn't ready. Um, but as I shared with you last week, I did have, uh, I just started to get the sense of I need it, and I'm going to try now anything she tells me to do. It's certainly uh, a new approach. <laughs> and uh, And I had that experience that I talked to you about where, um, where I was kind of either going to pick up a drink or I was going to get on my knees and pray to God. And I got on my knees and prayed to God. And so then uh, I went to my son to say, I'll do anything now, I believe. And uh, we read the third step. I was younger then. It was on my knees the first time. Uh, <laughs> I have a tough time getting on my knees today, i got to tell you. Uh, not because I won't get on my knees in front of God, it's harder to get up. To get up. So uh, I needed to be carpeted now when I take a third step with somebody or we sit down. Um, but <laughs> I've learned to accept my limitations in sobriety. Uh, and, and I did that with her and I said, well, what? now what? And she said, get the pen out. Let me walk you through this. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. There's got to be more because I've been waiting forever for this. There's got to be more. Because I had, you know, to, to back up in this period of, you know, trying to find God and doesn't work for me, I had uh, bought every spiritual book ever mentioned in any AA meeting. Um, was at a pizzeria one day in Bensonhurst and spoke to these born-again Christians and started to meet with them. Uh, when they told me that AA was a false god, I told them to have a nice life. But... <laughs> I, you know, I wanted, I was seeking, I just couldn't find because I wasn't ready because I guess I didn't, I wasn't fully wanting. And then uh, I remember uh, my sponsor giving me a tape because I, I didn't understand this make a decision, turn my will thing. And, you know, she told me like a hundred different things. Um, my will is uh, my thinking. And, uh, my actions on my life and, and just relax, you know, just try to align with what would God have you do, try to do the next right thing. I don't know, it seemed like it was, they, they're telling me it's a cornerstone in my surprise, it seems too simple. She gave me a tape once to kind of help me, but I wasn't, didn't have a second step yet, really. And, uh, it's an analogy I really like and I, and I, and I use. It was a, about a, a gentleman who was a priest who had a sick mom and she couldn't go up and down the stairs and he'd say mom I'll carry you upstairs but hold on to my neck hold on to me don't grab the banister because when you grab the banister and hold on it's harder for me to get you upstairs you're right okay and she'd hug his neck they'd go two steps and she'd grab that banister and it would take him about an hour to get upstairs because she kept grabbing that banister because she felt he was going to drop her and he said, you know, we could have got upstairs in five minutes if she would have just let go of the banister. And that made perfect sense to me. I wasn't ready to do a third step, but I liked the story. <laughs> and I had a lot of that going on. And then, really, that day that I was delivered uh, from a desire for a drink in a bar that I used to drink in and was able to work there for eight hours, I truly knew there was something out there that was watching out for me. And um, I couldn't explain it to you if my life depended on it, but I didn't need to explain it to you. I just needed to know it for me. And uh, she said, there is no secret. We don't have a special code that we, don't, that we only give you when we think you've suffered enough. Just need, she says, the, first, the only example you need to know of your third step is if you're doing your fourth step. It's... You do the remaining steps that God has laid out for you as an alcoholic. That's what you need to do. And she said, you know, uh, after you're like sober three months, the reality is on a daily basis you'll be put in situations where there is a right way and a wrong way, and you know the right way. So what are you going to do about it? And that made sense to me. I mean, there were very few things I was confused about. A lot of things I just didn't like the answer. 
I didn't want to do the right thing, but I knew what the right thing was to do. And maybe I didn't even have the power to do the right thing, but I knew what the right thing to do was. You know, I had to be really honest with that. And she said, just get moving forward. And she uh, I said, I, I, I don't know about Mrs. Jones, the nut. I, I really don't understand that. <laughs> she, she laughed. She was like, okay, let's, uh, who pissed you off today? And, you know, there wasn't, like, a short list. You know, so I said, you mean like in the last hour? Besides you, you know, and, you know, and, uh, and, you know, the funny thing was I had, I, I was doing some work already, and she said, let's just walk through one, and she walked me through the columns, so I was like, oh, and I got it. I just got it. I had been looking at things from, for months and didn't get it, but when I was ready, I got it. That's what it, I mean. That's just what happened. Uh, no amount of willpower on my part or her part was going to make me ready. But uh, my experience with a higher power made me ready, and uh, and I started writing. And uh, I wrote out all the people I ever knew. Oddly enough, I had a resentment against each and every one of them. Uh, I have yet to meet a person for more than five minutes that I haven't had a son again. You know, at least before AA. Gotten a little better since I'm in here. Um, and then she she directed me to think about institutions I dealt with and my church and all those other things and to write any resentments I had against them down. More paper killed. Um, I, it was just I had a lot of resentments. And then... Uh, she wanted me to write out my fears. I was like, is there enough paper? I was full of fear my whole life, just my whole life. I was just one ball of nerves. And uh, and I wrote them all down that time, I thought. And uh, my sexual inventory, which, you know, the first time I heard about that having to be put down, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, and then I realized I didn't remember a lot of it, so it was going to work out okay. And, um, and there, you know, there were a couple of, he looked like that, don't know his name. She looked like that, don't know her name. Um, but there was also a lot that, that was true, and I knew who they were and what I had done or not done. And, and I finished all that writing out. Uh, before I was ready, I couldn't write for more than 15 minutes at a clip. But this time, when I was writing out this inventory, I would start each time with prayer as she instructed me for me to be open to whatever comes out and to ask for his help to be as true as I could be. And I did that. And then the stuff was just flowing. I sat down and I wrote for hours at a clip. Like a news reporter, I felt nothing. I was just writing. It was a story that happened to somebody. It really wasn't like I wasn't emotionally invested to it. I was just writing out, this is what happened, this is what I did, this is how I was affected, this is how I affected them. And there were a couple of things, quite frankly, where I didn't know. I knew what I did was wrong, but I didn't know. I really didn't know why I did it, and I just left that blank. Because she told me, well, you don't know, leave it blank, don't make it up. We'll figure it out. We had a lot of figuring out to do. Because I, you know, I really didn't understand a lot of things. I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't at the head of that class of 88, that's for sure. And, uh, there were a lot of things that really needed to be shown to me over and over again. So I was a little thick about my part of things because I was so invested in being the victim and how you hurt me. I was having a tough time what was wrong on my end. And uh, I put down some stuff, but some stuff she needed to help me see uh, eventually. And uh, it didn't take me 19 months to write my inventory. It took me uh, less than a week. It was thorough, though. And, uh, and it was certainly as honest as it could be at the time. And it was certainly a new way of looking at things. 
I really didn't like that column about, you know, me hurting them. I really didn't like that column. You could keep that to yourself, thank you. Because that meant like I was a part of why my life is a mess. And I really didn't like that because, as I said, I always had that theory of being in the car at the car wash getting stuff thrown at me. Oh, you mean I selected the hot wax? Oh, man. I didn't want to really admit that. So, uh, you know, I used to hate when I'd be at a meeting. If you're, if you're eating a blank sandwich, you must have ordered it, you know. I, I didn't like that stuff, but it was true. And uh, I really didn't know how selfish I was, so I started putting pen to paper or how self-centered I was, you know. I used to hear this stuff at... Uh, Meetings, you know, we're uh, egomaniacs with low self-esteem. Everybody would laugh. I'd go, huh, what are they talking about, you know? And so, like, this one guy said what, you know, he said that, and he says, and I never knew what they meant. I wouldn't ask the question, but this guy did, you know? And he said, yeah, I'm not much, but I'm all I ever think about. And I was like, oh, that's me. Oh, because I am all I ever think about. You're like dying of cancer. How does that affect me? You know? That's how I, I mean, that, that was my whole life. And now writing this stuff out, it was really painful for me to see. And, and uh, she, had, she had given me a rather shorter list of defects to look up. And, uh, and I did that. And, you know, there's not one that doesn't apply. And if I ever got my hands on that other list again, I'm sure I'd have something to fill out on all 70, whatever of them. And, uh, you know, I, I finally finished this inventory, and uh, you know, I was so happy with myself. <laughs> I got to tell you, I felt good. I felt like I've grown up. I did something for me. Not because you wanted me to do it, not because they wanted me, not because it's expected of me, because it's what I need, and I did it. I feel great. I had, like, the right, the AA rite of passage. Where's my strike? Did a fourth step. You know, I want the strike. You know? And uh, I called her up, like, all excited. Annie, Annie, Annie. I finally finished. She says, good. She says, uh, when are we going to meet to do fifth step? I don't know. Whenever you want. No, no. When can we meet? What are you doing tomorrow? I have plans tomorrow. Plans doing what? Well, I have to take some. Okay. Well, what are you doing the next day? Nothing. Uh, I'll be at your house at 6 o'clock. Why? To do your fifth step. Oh, okay. I hung up the phone, and I'm thinking, this was a woman who up until this point was, it's a day at a time, take it easy, stay in the day, put your head where your feet are, don't argue with anybody who's not present, take it easy. Um... Oh, you're agitated? It's 8.25. It's Thursday night. You just left the meeting and you're on the phone with your sponsor. What are you going to do now? You're going to go home, pray, and go to sleep. All is well in your world, Lisa. I went from this to when are we going to meet? What about? She thought, you know, Annie must be a little off tonight. Hung up the phone. Really? What was that about? You know, and to, uh, to back up a little bit, uh, well, I'll get to it afterwards. But she 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 was dead set on this appointment. But I'm puffed up. I did my sports stuff. I have arrived in AA. I'm doing great. Five to six, two nights later. I got to get out of here. She's coming. I, if I go out the front, she'll see me because it's, you know, she'll see me. Five to six, she's probably coming down the block. I'll go out the back. There is no back. I'll make one. <laughs> shut the light. Shut the light. I shut all the lights in my apartment. And I sat there. She'll never know I'm home. And the doorbell rang. Don't answer it. You know? And, you know, kind of like that thing you say in the scary movies. Don't go in the basement. That's kind of how I felt. Don't now. Not now. The music's getting louder in my head, you know? She rings again. She's stalking me. And I said, I'll let her in, but I won't tell her a thing. So I buzz her in, and I put the lights on. And she comes up. She goes, what's the matter with you? What? What do you mean? I'm like, and she goes, what's the matter with you? I said, 
I don't want to tell you a thing. I had the lights out, and I wasn't going to answer the door. <laughs> she laughed. <laughs> she was, I see doing an inventory has really helped you with your fear. This is great. You know? <laughs> she always had something funny to say, God bless her. And uh, I laughed. And she says, let's pray now. I said, you want to take your coat off? And we laughed, you know, and, and uh, we prayed. And I calmed down. And I started to share my inventory with her. Every last bit of it. All in one sitting. Bless her heart. Because I would have shot me by the time we got midway through my fears and told me see you tomorrow. But we sat down through the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I, I have to tell you, uh, <laughs> You know, this was my life, right, right on this piece of paper, and uh, and it wasn't pretty. And uh, we're going through the resentments, and the only thing appearing to change are names and dates, but the behavior is all there. The same scenario, the setup, my sabotage, the blow up, me writing people off out of my life. This is what I did. Resolve a conflict? No. Screw you, die. You know, I, I come from uh, an Italian background, and it's like you get to a certain point, that's it, you're dead. You know, you could be alive another 40 years. To me, you're dead. That's how I lived my whole life. And it was just more and more of this. And it got to a point about two hours into me reading her, you know, my resentments, where I'm laughing because it's pathetic. You know, and if it was somebody else's life, I would have been laughing on the floor. But it was my life, so it was only semi-pathetic. And um, and I just said to her, "This is ridiculous." She says, "Yes, it is, isn't it?" But what was particularly ridiculous to me was when I got up to the people that I had met and encountered and dealt with after I had walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Nothing had changed. Not one damn thing. I was sober, no, I had the elimination of alcohol, but I wasn't behaving soberly. I was still behaving in the same twisted, dark manner that I had always been, but I cleaned it up a little. Because, you know, like, quite frankly, um, the stuff that I was pulling for years, I really couldn't do sober. So, like, the real extreme parts of my behavior went away, but I was still doing the same thing. And I have to tell you, it was not uh, it was not pleasant for me to read this stuff with her. She shared a lot with me. Uh, it was clear that I was um, I was afraid to share this stuff with her. There was a lot of, for me, embarrassing stuff in there, stuff that should never, ever, ever be told if I ever want to see you again. Because I used to tell some of the stuff to people I knew I'd never see again. But to tell all of it in one place to one person I'm actually planning to see next week, I'd never done that before in my life. And this was certainly a new experience. And uh, I know um, I didn't want to tell her a word when that night began. And as it, a few minutes in, it's just rolling out of me like nothing. And uh, that was because she shared her most embarrassing story with me after I told her about one resentment. She saw I was still a little, and she goes, you seem really jammed up. I'm going to share with you the most embarrassing thing I have in my inventory. And I was thinking, why? We're here about me. But, but, but she did. And I didn't really think it was all that embarrassing, but it was to her. And it just, I don't know, it just opened the door, and it all came out. And uh, and I thank God every day for that woman. And, uh, you know, I was able to get to that place with her because of something that happened with us over a period of time. She wasn't somebody I met in the five and dine two weeks before. She's somebody I met at one of my first or second AA meetings who um, – of all the people who were giving me their telephone number, she was the one person who asked me for her, for mine. She called me the next day at work 
and dissuaded me from going to Houlihan's and to go to Exchange Views to our meeting. Uh, she's the one who told me, I have the coffee commitment at Bay Ridge on Saturday morning. I expect you there at 9 o'clock a.m. Okay. I got that. I didn't ask for the spot to me right away because she was like, she was one of those people in the in crowd. You know, the people working the steps, happy, joyous. I was like, she, 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 she ain't gonna help me. I'm a loser. So I asked somebody else to be my sponsor first because they wanted this list called like the interim sponsor list. Like, she has to say yes because she's on the list. So I'll ask her. I didn't know anything about it, but she was on the list and I, I knew her. Like, there was a list of, like, 12 names, but I knew one when I saw the last car. And, uh, you know, that sponsor, uh, I called her every day, like she told me, and I told her what went wrong in the day, and she would say to me, did you have a drink? And I said, no. She was, then you're a winner today. Okay. I hung up. I go, that doesn't make sense. They told me if I don't change, I'll die. Why is she telling me whatever I do is okay? So now I'm following around this other woman like a puppy dog. I haven't asked her to sponsor me. And I'm noticing things when I'm talking to this woman. Whenever we talk, we're either talking about Annie or Lisa or a friend of hers. I, you know, I used to get really annoyed about this friend of hers. I used to say, well, is she making that up? Oh, her experience, so she'll just pull out this friend of hers, you know? And it just seemed like... Whenever I would try to talk about, you know, somebody who wasn't there, somebody, she'd be like, well, let's talk about you. Let's talk about me. And she taught me early on not to gossip. And I knew, like, whatever I said to Annie was going to stay with Annie, or if it didn't stay with her, it would be yet another a friend of mine story. And although I didn't like that, I, I knew nobody would trace it back to me, so that was okay. You know, I had a lot of fear. And it just seemed no matter what I told this woman, it was okay. And usually she would share something with me, and then she would do something crazy like tell me how to do it differently. And, you know, I grew up in a religion where every Saturday afternoon at a particular time, I would go tell them what I did for the week. They would tell me a certain amount of prayers. And then I heard, and they never said, now go out and sin again. I never heard, do it different next week. Don't come back with that stuff next week. Ask God for help. They may have been saying that, but that's not what I heard. You know, and she was telling me different things. When I would talk about something I did wrong that day, we would look at, well, ten different things happened. You could have got off here. You could have got off at this stop. You could have elected it. Ring the bell at the bus on this stop, and she would walk me through, like, how I could have changed. So by the time I got up to doing an inventory in the fifth step, there was nobody but her that I would have even imagined doing it with. I heard some people talking about they were going to talk to a priest or uh, their therapist. That was a big one. A lot of people were going to take it with their therapist. And even I knew that was kind of like, to me, cheating. They gotta listen. They're not gonna, you, they're not supposed to say anything. It's supposed to be somebody who did what you did. And who you're gonna have to look in the eye a week later. You know, that kind of stuff. So even I knew not to cheat that way. Now other people have done that and it's worked well for them. I don't mean to say for them it's cheating. For me that would have been cheating. And, uh, you know, my first instinct after I had finished my fifth step with this woman was to never see her again. You know? Like, when I kissed her goodnight, it was like, it's been nice knowing you. You know, that was like the joke I said to myself, because every other time I left, if I had shared any amount of information, I would never talk to you again. But that wasn't my experience, you know, and uh, from there, uh, I went on to other things, and we'll talk about that next week, but when I was done with my fifth step, I didn't feel any great sense of relief. I have to be honest with you. I felt like, oh, my God, what a mess. That's really how I felt. And uh, while I felt better that I had done what was put in front of me, I didn't feel 
great. But um, I followed what she told me to do, and we'll talk about that next week. But things started happening. I went through the remainder of the steps much, rather much more quickly than those first few. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> it seemed like I finally got a head of steam under me. And I started to have people put in my life that I was bringing through the steps. You know when I got relief about the stuff in my inventory? When I started hearing the same stuff over and over again with new women in AA. Oh, my God, are we horribly the same. I mean, come on. You know, it is just, I thought I was so different. If you only knew, I may be beyond help. And yet, every inventory that someone has shared with me, it's like, okay, when are they going to get to? They slept with a woman. I know it's coming. Yeah, it was really embarrassing. Oh, you thought about sleeping with a woman. Close enough. All right. You know, it really doesn't matter. I don't care what you did. Oh, you, you lied. You cheated. You stole. That's imaginative. Great. You know? And they look at you like, you're really going to hate me now because I'm going to tell you the one thing I've been holding on forever. And you're like, well, hold on to that. Get the no dose. <laughs> We're only halfway through. You know. I uh and it's not that I don't care about you, it's just, you know, it's real, you know garden variety alcoholic stuff. We do the same kind of behavior they talk about in the book and uh our inability to deal well with other people and they take a different flavor, shape or form, but it's the same stuff over and over again, and uh, the only hope is to stop drinking and to find a solution through these steps, but uh, I really started to feel a part of the human race when I started hearing other people's inventories, realized I'm like everybody else, I, you know, we're all the same thing, you know, all right, so you lived here when you did that, or you, you, you did this before I did that, it really didn't matter, it was all the same thing, and that's really when the relief happened for me. And, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about now that if one were to read this book, you would get the impression that if you take one fourth step, one fifth step, and continue to work the rest of the steps, you never have to go back here again. Thank you. This was enough. But, you know, I really believe that. I believe that strongly for a number of years, and when people talk about, I've done multiple thoughts of, you know what I used to think? Hope you got it right the last time. What arrogance. I mean, that's really what I believed, that I didn't know any better. I really didn't know any better. Well, I'll tell you what happened for me. Um, I think I was about five, five or six years sober when Annie decided to move. I'll add how I read it, away from me. Because <laughs> it was still a little bit about me. Uh, and then I tried to milk this long-distance relationship. I hung on to that for about a year. It wasn't working, but I was hanging on to it. And then uh, even I had to agree, like, this isn't working. And I'm starting to feel flat. I got nothing to give. My sponsees are now annoying me. They're asking too much. They're like... You know, they're like blood suckers out of my skin. I can't take these people because I had nothing to give them. I was spiritually dead again because I had nowhere to go with my stuff. I guess I got to get another sponsor. There are no women good enough for me. I have to go searching for the ones with the message. I'll search high and I'll search low. And I went far and wide and ended up back in my neighborhood with another Italian woman named Annie. God's joke. And, uh, and she was a great lady and, uh, you know, when I was first coming around I sort of knew her and then she had a, a ton of kids in a short period of time, so she wasn't around at meetings. And then she started coming back to meetings when they were a little older, you know, meetings in my neighborhood, and I hooked up with her. And 
And she had a, a really good message, according to Lisa Lisa. And so I said, she's the one. I will anoint her, you know? <sighs> so sick. And uh, that's like on the inside. On the outside, I was like, Annie, could you be my sponsor? You know? Such a loser, you know? And uh, she laughed. She's like, you, you know, we've been talking every day for, for a few months. I thought I was. Once again. I said, but I didn't ask you. You know? She's like, okay, do you feel better now? Yeah. And so now I'm talking to her every day and I'm reading her my 10 steps and, you know, going through that process. And she's like, you know, I'm noticing a lot of patterns here. Really? Because I wouldn't notice them if they hit me in the head, you know, because they're mine. So, like, you know, you seem to be doing this, this, and this over and over again. And I'm like, oh, that was in my, my inventory. That fourth step. The sacrosanct, sacred fourth step that I did with my first sponsor. So I said, yeah, you know, that was in my first inventory. I must be sliding back into that. She goes, sliding back? <laughs> Every day you have something with this. She goes, you are rolling with power. You're not sliding back. And she says, you know, I'm trying to help you here. And, uh, you know, it might be helpful to the process. Instead of me dealing with this, you know, one incident, one day at a time, maybe this would be a good time in your life to go back over your steps again and do a whole inventory again. What? I did that. How's it working for you? Not so good. So I, I don't know that I need to go through all of that. Uh, I'll think about it. What really happened was every fiber in my body said, no way. I did that once. That was a lot of work. I'm not going through that again. The book says you do a fourth step, you do this, and you do a tenth step, and you're good. What does she know? And every day, as I'm continuing to wreak havoc in my life, she may have a point. This was not unlike the first person who told me I had a drinking problem. She may have a point. This is, you know, I'm not someone who, when something's brought to my attention, my first reaction is, great, I'll go do something about it. My first reaction is, you don't know a thing. Why did I think you knew it? You're an idiot. On the inside. On the outside, I'll think about it. Because, you know, I've learned to be a little polite in AA. That's a good idea. I'll think about it. Walking with freaking moron. You know, <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> Writing their name on that list at the end of the day. And uh, she had dumped that suggestion on me. And, uh, and she was really good. She would make it once. She was not somebody who harped. And, uh, and I was continuing to read my inventory to her, and I'm like, really getting frustrated because she's not saying it, but I'm like, yeah, it's that pattern, it's that pattern, it's that pattern. And then I did something that, uh, in sobriety that ended up, uh, till this day, costing me a uh, friendship with somebody who I have been friends with since I was 14 years old. I hurt this person other than untreated alcoholism in AA. And uh, it wasn't a drink that motivated me to go back to the steps. It was the loss of this friendship. I knew I'd never get the friend back. It was somebody very close to me for many years, almost a, like a family member. And I said, do I have to kill off all of my friends and family before I go back to this, get back to work? called her up. I said, Annie, I'm ready. I told her what happened, and she said, I'm really sorry I came for that. She didn't tell me I sold you so. Had you not listened to me, that wouldn't have happened. She didn't tell me that. She didn't tell me that God punished me. She said, I'm really sorry I came for that. I'm not used to people like that in my life. And we went through the steps from step one again. And, uh, and I didn't like that, because that went against my strong belief. Never do I have to do it again if I don't drink. I had to learn to 
put aside my old ideas once again. Now, these weren't my drinking ideas. These were my warped ideas about Alcoholics Anonymous. I had to put them aside. This is embarrassing. i got to put solar behavior on. But it wasn't really solar behavior. And uh, I am happy to say that when I went through that resentment list again, not everybody I met at this point did I have a resentment again. So something in AA took hold. I don't know what it was, but something took hold. And I had very few new resentments and harms for the people who had already been in my life, like my close family that was still in my life even though I had hurt them. And I felt happy about that, yet there were still some things in there. And I have to tell you, um, It's a lot easier looking at stuff you did when you were drinking and you did wrong. You can kind of, because I kind of grew up in a family, it was okay, he was drunk, she was drunk. It's really a lot harder for me to look at the stuff that I did sober. Or, I guess, not truly sober, but without alcohol. That was a lot harder for me to look at. That second inventory did not flow easily. It did not... um it did not take five days or whatever it was the first time. Because I knew what happens now when you write it on paper. And so I sit down with yet another Italian Annie in a room in Bensonhurst to go through my inventory. And I'm sober a number of years in AA now. And I still had a couple of problems with figuring out what the exact nature of my wrongs were. I can never, ever in my life think I can take my inventory, whether it's for a whole life or one day's inventory, and think I understand me at all times. I need somebody else's help. Because the reality is, if you woke me up in the middle of the night, I would tell you that I am skinny and 27 years old. Because that's what I want to believe about myself. I still get shocked when I walk past and I go, man, I am fat. I mean, I have a tough time with reality. Now, if there's something that, like, Stevie Wonder could figure out by the sound of me walking in a room, you, you think I might have a problem understanding how I hurt you today? Maybe. Just maybe. I need help. Honesty does not come natural to me. I used to lie even when it would have been easier to tell the truth because it's just what I did. It came natural because if you knew who I was, you wouldn't want to be around me. I certainly didn't want to be around me. It takes a lot of work. I need help being honest. I need help being sober. I have a great life today because of this program. The people in it, and obviously the grace of God, because clearly you need a lot more power than human power to help people as sick as we are. But it is a process, and we have to deal with another person to keep us honest. It's very easy for me to go to a God who today I love and adore, and I know loves me and forgives me before I even do it, to talk to him about what I did wrong. It's like I know I've got to, you know, get out of jail free card with him. I'm not so sure about you, <laughs> you know, and that's the harder part. But if I don't share it with another person, it becomes okay. It's all right. I'll fix it tomorrow, next week, someday. I can lie. I meant it to help her. I didn't want to hurt her feelings. It was a lie of convenience. Maybe a drink will look good. I have to watch this stuff. I lied to myself for years, and that lying allowed me to be an active alcoholic. So I, I need to have this process of believing in a higher power, taking an inventory, and sharing it with another person, or else I don't stand a chance in this life. It's just my experience. Uh, I'm not going to just ram it down your throat, but the reality is that um, I haven't met anyone yet who couldn't benefit from going through the steps yet one more time. 
and, uh, you know, it's funny because, you know, I, I talked about earlier, there was, um, you know, my list of fears in that first inventory, and I, I said I wrote down all of them, I thought. But there was something I had been afraid of since I was a child that was so ingrained in me, it didn't even occur to me to write down. Since as far back as I can remember, I was afraid that if when my mother died, I would lose my mind. I don't know where I got this. It was just there. And uh, I was just afraid of that my whole life. And I never told anybody that. It was just something I was afraid of. And when I was like eight years old, there was this guy in the neighborhood. We used to call him Louis, Louis Ruh because he would walk around the neighborhood going, Ruh, Ruh, Ruh. I don't know why. So I asked somebody one day, I said, oh, he lost his mind after his wife died. It could happen. I mean, this stuff in a kid, you know, you don't tell anybody. It just lays there. It got so deep in me. I was just, I started developing, and I shared this last week, a lot of irrational fears. More than I would care to count with you tonight because we're running out of time. But I had developed um, so many fears and phobias that I was labeled agoraphobic. It was difficult for me to leave safe areas. And um, I used to drink or take other things, and I would go places. So I thought I was doing fine. And I got sober. I can't do those things. And my safe space started getting smaller and smaller. I went for help. And I got help. And I started to get out and do more and, and do things. But there were still some things I couldn't do, I was afraid of. Couldn't do, couldn't go. And then I put those things on my inventory, but I didn't put the thing that was made, that started it all, which was this fear that I would lose my mind if my mother died. All these other things, I wasn't afraid of dying. I was afraid I was going to lose my mind and end up in a mental institution if I did this, that, or the other thing. I'd be carted away. And uh, for whatever reason, in the second inventory, I put that down, that I'm afraid that if my mother dies, I'm going to lose my mind. And I talked to my sponsor about it, and and she suggested that I, she says, you may need some outside help with all this other stuff. I said, okay, I'll go. And I went and I got some help. My mother was still alive. I was okay. But there were still some things I couldn't do. And I was going to this therapy every day. I mean, every week, same time, getting nowhere. Very fast, getting nowhere. And there were these last couple of things I couldn't do, and I didn't look like there was any hope of it happening. But something inside me said, don't give up. Keep coming back. Keep trying. And I went every week. And I got no further than before, but I kept going. And my mother died. And I didn't lose my mind. And I said, I was wrong about that. I have been wrong about so many things in my life and have made decisions and actions based on these wrong thinking. I have to once again let go of these old ideas. There's nothing I won't do today. I couldn't leave like the Bensonhurst Bay Ridge area for a while. I go anywhere today, any way, I don't care, whatever it takes. I drive a car, I ride a motorcycle, I fly in planes, I'll do what I got to do, I go anywhere, I am a free person today. It started with me writing my inventory. If I didn't get it down on paper, how in the world am I ever going to look for help? I believe strongly that the illumination came not from me going to therapy, but from me being willing to go every week until I got help. The help I got came from God, not from the guy I was seeing every week for whatever it was in charge. I went wherever they tell me to go. 
but the help came from God. But if it never was written down on paper, it never would have happened. And I have to tell you, when I wrote that down on paper, I was like, why am I writing that down? God put it there. You know, and it wasn't in my first inventory. It was in my second inventory. And who only knows what will be on my fifth inventory? I just know that more will be coming. I'm never done. And uh, something happened recently that has me, you know, searching again for another It doesn't exist. And uh, I'll end up asking, you know, who I had my eye on five months ago, which is my pattern, because I have to shop them for a while, make sure that, you know, I didn't mistake anything, make sure they don't do anything that, you know, is contrary to how I put them in a box. But uh, what's most important is that I know I need to go through the steps again, even though my life is great today. I wouldn't trade in my life for anything. But two years ago, I wouldn't have traded in my life for anything, and my life is better today. I don't ever want that progress to stop. So I know what I need to do, and um, I'm happy to be sober and alive. And continuing on this path closer to what I believe my higher power would have me do. But it doesn't happen sitting at home watching CSI, which is what I would really love as a program of recovery. But <laughs> but it really hasn't helped. So here I am. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much for listening to me tonight. God bless. Okay, I'd like now to introduce our guest speaker for the month of uh, January. Uh, Lisa R. from Brooklyn. <laughs> my name is Lisa Risi. I am an alcoholic. I'd like to apologize for my cheering section that I brought with me from Brooklyn, but uh, we kind of thought you guys needed a little Brooklyn, so uh, we brought it with us. But uh, once again, I'd, I'd like to thank this group uh, for having me here for the month. Uh, share my experience share my with you. Um, you know, t tonight uh, I'm here to speak on my experience with steps six, seven, eight, and nine, and uh, just to backtrack briefly to the end of my fifth step that I shared about last last week. The first time I took the fifth step, um, I did not feel any great sense of relief, joy gladness or anything else I had heard other people share. It was not my experience, uh, not immediately anyway. Um, I, you know, I, I sat down with my sponsor and uh, looked, at the, looked at the wreckage that was my life, my wretched little life, and, um, you know, all, all the malarkey was gone and... Uh, you know, even I had to see that the only thing that was changing were names and dates. So uh, chances are, you know, when you have a hundred incidents of the same situation, like maybe I was involved, you know. And uh, maybe I played a part. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can make light of it today, but at the time I was totally deflated. And... Uh, pretty like feeling sorry for myself and what a mess is what I felt and uh, I said to my sponsor I said, what a mess I have a lot of work to do she started laughing as she always does uh, whenever I speak to her about my conception of things uh, apparently I'm fodder for a lot of laughter for this woman and um, she said like I know I've seen you at meetings and I know you've read the book but like, do you pay attention I think so, to the best of my ability, which in the end didn't turn out to be so good. Um, and she said, you know, uh, the next step is about getting ready for God to remove your defects of character, not for you to remove your defects of character. And I was like, well, that's good because I don't think I can, you know, because <laughs> I was doing the same stuff sober that I was doing drunk. And like I said, some of the extreme behavior was gone because I just couldn't pull that off. 
sober, but if I could have, I would have. Uh, somebody shared before they wanted to change from doing certain behavior, you know, that I did too, but a little harder to do when, you know, you remember the whole night, you know. So uh, the rules change because you're coherent, and uh, it's a lot harder to lie to yourself. Um, but a lot of the, the bad behaviors were there, and, and I, I lose, I, like I said, I was totally deflated. I saw what a wreck I had made, and uh, I don't think I've ever been more entirely ready to have God remove my defects of character than at that precise moment when I saw what a mess I had made of my life and the lives of the people I encountered. And uh, and I knew I needed help. And uh, she suggested that I spend an hour by myself and review the first five proposals or steps, like it tells me to do in the book, before I move forward. And I did that. And uh, I'd love to tell you that um, immediately therein, I did the rest of the steps. Uh, I, um, again, once again, my inability to pay attention, uh, I built in my own, and then we'll take a little break. Wow, that was good. Where I got that behind me? And uh, I, I mean, I read the seven-step prayer after being ready, but... I could read a prayer all I want, but what started to happen was I really didn't move forward with writing my eighth step right away, which is what I was instructed to do. And um, it just seemed a little fast. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, if you look in the book, the only time it actually gives you a break is the one hour after the fifth step. And... Um, you know, if you actually read the words in the book, not like take a general sweeping impression, uh, actually read it like a textbook instead of a novel. That's what it tells you to do. And then there's like my interpretation. And, uh, and you know, after six days, God rested. And after the six steps, so did I. You know, and... Um, <sighs> And, and I had some pretty uh, predictable results. Um, started to feel discontent. I started to judge those people in front of me. He's full of it. Come on. I saw what you... I, I've seen you in action, pal. Tell another story. And, you know, that kind of stuff. Starting to just trust is coming back and a lot of other things and some other behavior that um, I'm not going into here. They're taping. But... Um, the thing is, uh, it seemed like I had to hit a second level of bottom with this stuff, and uh, I thankfully did not drink, and I asked for help again, and I was instructed to, to, to review the first five proposals again, to ask for help yet again. And this time... I then started writing out my stuff list because, you know, you know, this is painful not to, you know. And uh, I'd love to tell you that just because I was starting to write out my stuff list, that behavior was going away, but it's not in my time. It's um, it's, a, it's a process. Um, I would love to tell you that all my defects of character have been removed permanently, obliterated, uh, white out through them. Uh, that's really not been my experience, but my my honest experience is that everything that I honestly ask God to help me with, I get help with. And the stuff that's still there, it's because I'm not asking for help enough. That's really my experience. I can be just flat out honest with you that the only thing standing between me and full removal of my deepest character is, yeah, you guessed it, me. I don't. I can't imagine, based on my experience that I've had to date, that God will want me to suffer the way I do on a daily basis. So, like, that's me. Any suffering I have is because I've elected to suffer. I've elected not to ask for help with those things. And uh, the good news is that the longer that I stay sober a day at a time, my tolerance for pain has seemed to go down. 
So I can't roll around in the stuff that I rolled around in quite so well or as long. And even I am like, oh, stop yourself. You know, I mean, I get tired of it. You know, it's like, it's just pathetic. I, I mean, but, you know, there are some usual favorites that I can roll into, like getting slighted uh, very easily from other people's behavior, self-pity. Uh, and I am, like, just a malcontent by nature. I need to, like, on a daily basis, get help with that. And I think that's just from, like, being a New Yorker, but I, I mean, I, I need help with that defect, you know? And these are things that that I, I struggle with daily. It's not like I say this one prayer once and, you know, hope for the best. I, it's, a, it's a process daily, you know? I, I get a daily reprieve from my drinking problem, and I get, when I try, reprieve from my other problems. And, um, and I have to cooperate. I mean, for a significant time in my recovery, I had a tardiness problem. Uh, actually, what it meant was I was really disrespectful of other people's time, like my boss and my friends. And, I, you know, I had this thing about, I don't want to be the first one there. I don't want to wait for you so you can wait for me, you know. And, uh, you know, the, it was coming up a lot. And uh, in my daily inventory, so I decided I was going to fix it. I have never had a problem get worse more than when I try to fix it. So um, I went from being 10 minutes late for work in the morning to half an hour, an hour, because I'm fixing it. And uh, my sponsor was just like, what are you talking about? I can't help you. You can't help you. You need to go to the one with the power. That one is God. May you find him now. She would say this to me over and over again, whatever my thing was. I hated her. I hated that line. But when things would come up, and until this day, when things come up and I find myself in a situation where my defects are like up and I'm acting out, there she is, the little Italian lady in the back of my head. You have no power. I have no power. God has the power. You need to find God. Find God now. That's what I need to do when these things happen in my daily life. Um, and uh, I uh, I found out that when I ask for a defect to be removed, I need to cooperate. So if I'm asking to not be late, I need to go to bed earlier. I need to not go to the diner and have five cups of coffee. Oh, and a little piece of chocolate cake, thank you. You know, and uh, and no, you don't need to see the Mary Tyler Moore rerun yet again on TV Land at two. You know, I mean, these are the things that I was doing. You know, and wondering why am I late in the morning? You know, uh, I used to be able to be out all night drinking and show up to work. Yeah, but you know, useless. Um, so. Uh, you know, something as minor, 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 minor as being late for work, I couldn't get that I needed God's help. So uh, it was a process learning it in the other areas of my life. Uh, but I kept moving forward in the steps because that seemed to be the only thing that worked uh, for me. And uh, I started writing out my eight step list in the way that my sponsor had laid it out for me. She, she said... Uh, I think a good place to start is with your resentment list from your fourth step. Like, yeah, I guess you're right. And she's like, come on, let's face it. We went through those resentments. There wasn't a person you resented. You didn't harm. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you got a point there. Because I couldn't, like, quietly resent you in a corner. Oh, you hurt me. I'm, I'm going to go sit over here and hope bad things happen, you know? That wasn't me. I mean, other people may have lived like that, but I, like, purposely went out of my way to see that you felt as much discomfort as I did. And if I got you to feel more discomfort, all the better. I won. You know, so that's kind of the way I live. So there was a little bit of wreckage there. And, you know, I got through listing out those people, how I harmed them, what my part in harming them was, and then my proposed how I was going to fix it in the next step. 
and I'm like, oh. I mean, I, I had, you know, a hundred and something resentment, so there was some writing there, and uh, I was like, oh, I finished all that, she was like, all right, get to, now get all the people from your uh, sexual inventory. I didn't hurt them. So I said, yeah, I know, write it out. And uh, I finished that list. It wasn't a hundred, but um, and that was more a, a reflection of my not being particularly attractive when I was drinking as opposed to my virtue, but we'll just leave it at that. And um, the other thing is uh, I figured, I, all right, we, we hit the big bases, and uh, she said, I want you to go back through your life and think of every person you've interacted with. Make sure you didn't miss anybody. How could I miss anybody? We hit every base. You know? I missed a few people. There were actually some people, apparently, I didn't have resentments against. I thought there were none, but there were a couple I didn't, but I heard them anyway. But um, on the list they went. And then uh, she suggested that, um, based on a few things I had shared with her, that I need to look at my work record and my expense account record and uh, my giving a full week's work record and a couple of other things. And so uh, it just seemed like every time I turned around and thought I was done with this darn list, there was some other area of my life she wanted me to look at. And uh, I'm glad she didn't give it to me all at once. I guess she knew what she was dealing with, because uh, I, I, I don't know. But, uh, but I, I got through uh, writing that list out, except for three names, the magical three. I don't want to put them on the list because even though they tell you to only think about the step that you're on, you'd have to be a mental midget not to know what happens once they get on the list. <laughs> I'm not interested. I'll pass. Thank you. You know? I, I really felt that way. I, I just, there's no way. Not these three people. Not on a bet. And so uh, she'd say, how's that list coming? Ah, I'm just a few more. How's that list coming? Just a few more. Same few? Yep. What are you going to do, Elise? I don't know. I don't want to put them on the list. I'm not interested. Can I just go on with the ones I have? No, not really. Uh, needs to be thorough. Needs to be everyone. Uh, no, I'm not doing this because I'm not ever going to make them into these three people. And uh, there's nothing you're going to say that's going to convince me. So let's just not talk about it. Now it's dwelling on my mind because she left she left this little bomb for me. Any suggestion you're not willing to take in Alcoholics Anonymous means that you have some level of denial about your alcoholism. You think that you have power of alcohol because you're not willing to do everything. You better think about that, young lady. Or Missy or whatever one of her terms of endearment were for me. And uh, in my head, in my head, in my head, and uh, so she got added to the list of people who should die. <laughs> and uh, she always showed up on my, she, I mean, she didn't show up on my thoughts, but she was definitely in the daily inventory. And uh, I actually, like, couldn't go to her with them, so I had this other person that I would tell my Annie inventory to. And, uh you know, but every now and then I would call her, you know, the only person on my tent step today was you, you know, and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we go through this process and, uh, and I'm, and I'm fighting this because there's just, I have unresolved business with these three people. That's really what it came down to. And, uh, and if I have to be totally honest, it was my pride because I knew I didn't want to face these people eye to eye because I was ashamed of what I had done. And, being sober and in God's grace just wasn't enough for me at the time. I did not have what it took to see them, my eye to your eye, and talk about what I did. That's why they weren't on the list. I could not voice that then. I was just like, they don't deserve my amends, is where I was coming from when I was talking to her. But the truth was, um, although they had hurt me in their own way, it was really my shame about the way I had hurt them and the way I had behaved as an individual. I was, uh, I just could not fathom meeting these people face to face. And, uh, you know, she would say things to me, Lise, 
you put them on the list, and then you become willing. I was like, yeah, we've been through this process with a lot of other stuff, Annie. I know where that's going. If they get on the list, I'm sitting with them. It's just a matter of time. You know, I, I mean, I knew that. I just knew it. And uh, and she just said, you need to pray to forgive you and forgive them and to get their name on the list. Just put their name on the list. None of the other stuff. Just put their name. I was like a three-year-old, you know. I'm not going to, you know. And um, basically, uh, I'd love to tell you there was some momentous thing that made that happen. I just got tired of not doing what I had to do. Uh, I, I have no real explanation. Uh, nothing specific I can recall happened. It just came the day it was like, oh, enough already. Put the name on the list. And uh, it wasn't my voice, so I put him on the list. And then I eventually wrote out the rest of the stuff. And, you know, like the first person I made mean, it was one of those three, but, you know. And, and so that's probably why I was reluctant to do it, but... Uh, there is definitely a good process from going through writing the list. You can't just go running out there because, um, at least for me, uh, in spite of having gone through the steps up until that point, uh, I was still a little damaged. And, you know, like me alone doing this could be very scary. And uh, in spite of, you know, everything I'd been through and being walked through the exact nature of my wrongs and how to correct it, Somehow when I got to writing this stuff on a list and what I planned to do, something got lost in the Lisa translation, you know. And uh, I had to sit down with this list and go over it with her and talk about it and see does this really make sense in the light of day. And uh, we had a lot of laughs, actually, because I'm nuts. I mean, sober, trying to follow the path that's left for me, and I still had some wacky ideas about how to fix things. I really did. Um, I, uh, oh, it's just crazy. And I, uh, you know, I, I had uh, a friend who, uh, to say I was particularly friendly to her husband at one point. And um, I felt that, you know, I needed to fix that in a certain way, and uh, I was told, like, the way you fix that is to never darken their doorstep again, you know, and it's just like, yeah, but I don't feel good, so I can't open up about you feeling good, you know, it's like, you know, those kind of lessons, and, uh, you know, there's, I had this big list, and in the end, there were a lot of people that I really didn't need to make direct amends to. Uh, or I wasn't capable of, but that didn't get me off the hook. I had to look at those relationships and say, okay, when I find myself in those situations in the future, how am I going to behave? That person's gone, or I don't know where they are. And, um, you know, for me, uh, it wasn't just about once sitting down with a person and saying to them, you know, this is what I did, this is why I did it. Um there was a little more involved. You know, I, I had to take ownership for how I hurt them. I had to be very careful not to ever talk about how they hurt me or how they affected me. It was just about how I hurt them. And uh, most people have a tough time with that. Even if they hate your guts, it's a very awkward situation for the person you're making amends to, and they want to make nice. And uh, it was – I had to pray before I went to each person because – I needed the balance of knowing when to talk about my part and when to respect the fact that they didn't want to hear anymore. And that's a balance that I don't have naturally, and I needed God's help with that. And um, I also needed to ask them the question, you know, this is what I recall. Is there any other way I've hurt you that I haven't talked to you about that you want me to know about? I was like a really big blackout drinker. I was always like, when I asked that question, I was always like, oh, really do we have to go here? You know, I got this far and it's miserable enough already. And, um, you know, uh, I had talked to you guys about my friend Amory, who I grew up with, who uh, started taking me to church before I uh, 
came to AA and, you know, when we were, uh, you know, teenagers and young adults, she, she didn't drink like me. She, you know, she partied a little bit, but she wasn't like me. But she was a person who the next day would always tell me what I did. And, uh, I used to have this kind of like, she called me every day at a certain time and I would have this like, oh, she would call, but I need to know. She would call, but I need to know. And, that feeling was kind of like the way I felt every time I, I said to somebody, is there any other way I've hurt you? It's just like, please don't tell me. I'm only telling, I'm only asking because they told me to ask you. I don't want to know. You know, it's just like everything I remembered was painful. And, uh, and a couple people did tell me other things. And, uh, and in spite of my, uh, honest desire to want to take a full inventory, there were some things I was not capable of seeing how I hurt other people. I was so self-absorbed, I didn't see it. So this was an opportunity for me to get more information. And uh, and I had to ask them, uh, I would tell them what I felt I wanted to do to make things right. And I had to ask them if they were okay with that and if there was anything else I could do. And, you know, that's like, I don't know. Where I come from, you don't open with your chin like that. You know, it's like, come on, what are you going to ask me to do? You know, nobody's asked me to do anything that uh, wasn't the right thing to do. And that's all I would share with you. I'm not going to go into the gross and gory details. But nobody has asked me to do anything that's uh, not reasonable. Um, I would, you know, all I know is that um, I lived rough and hard when I was out there drinking, and uh, I hurt people without thinking, and I hurt a lot of people with malice and forethought. I wasn't some accidental hurter out there. There were some things I did accidentally, but a lot of it I did with malice and forethought, and I had to be honest about that, too. It's a lot easier to tell somebody, oh, I inadvertently hurt you because I was doing this and I wasn't thinking of you. It's a little harder to say, no, I really was looking to do this to you. Uh, that was harder for me, but... I had to do it because um, I I don't want to drink. I'm not doing it because I'm a good person. I have to be honest with you. I don't think I'm all that good of a person uh, by nature. Uh, I do these things because it's what I need to do to be free of alcohol. And um, it's terrific to sit down with somebody and say, this is what I plan to do. But I have to spend the rest of my life doing whatever that is. And in some instances... It's to never see them again. In some instances, it's to actually treat them with love, dignity, and respect. And in some cases, you know, write them a check. Uh, you know, whatever it is, you know. And uh, and it's and it's not about glad that's over. It's about living through that amends. And quite frankly, there's not that many people that I've had to do continuing amends with. I have a short list of friends my close family, and, and those are the ones that I have to do continuing day-by-day day amends with. Uh, you know, saying I'm sorry is useless. Um, my whole life I was sorry, uh, but I wasn't really sorry. I was, on the outside, I was like, uh-oh, they found out. Better say I'm sorry. And I'd go to them all, and, and, I, and I was probably, you know, meant I was sorry at the time somewhat. But many of the times I would just know that I need to say I'm sorry. So I would say I was sorry and, you know, they'd want to talk about it. I just wanted to say I was sorry and move on, you know. And I would, you know, make believe I was involved in this conversation where we're talking about how sorry I am. And then I would just be like, is this ever going to end and can I go have a drink? So this was entirely different. This was about me fessing up to do to what I did wrong, uh, looking about how I'm going to do it differently, and then with God's help, trying to do that a day at a time. And uh, not all of that has been easy. Uh, just because I realize that I've hurt somebody close to me doesn't mean that the very things that set me off in the first place don't still exist. I got I'm trying to change my life. 
chances are the fact that I've waltzed into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't mean that the people around me have decided to follow the 12 steps in their life. They don't need it. They're not an alcoholic. I need it. They may not change their behavior. They may very well still do the things that make me react internally in a certain way. What do I do now? I mean, it'd be great if everybody treated me like uh, perfectly the way that I deem they should, but it doesn't work out like that. And it's learning how to treat people with love, dignity, and respect, regardless of what they bring to the table. And then if they continue to bring bad things to the table, deciding, well, do I need to go to this battle every week? Probably not. I can remove myself from situations. That's an amend, too. I don't have to become a doormat because I happen to walk in, into AA. I, I can learn to be in relationships that are good for me. I can change relationships. I can find new friends. You know, these are part of my amends. If I find myself in a situation where every time I'm with this person, bad things are happening and we're not getting anywhere, I need to let them go for them. I don't need to, I don't need to suffer and I don't need to make them suffer. You know, and I've had to, to change some friendships since I'm sober. And uh, it's not that I don't still love and care for them, but uh, there's a guy back where I live, he says, I love you so much, I need to put you as far away from me as possible. You know, I, I understand that. I do, you know. But... Um, you know, I, I've developed a, a, a love and respect for my family uh, that I never had before. I used to be ashamed of my family. Uh, they really haven't changed much, but uh, I, I did learn through the process of going through these steps that, you know, they carried me for a long time. Uh, I really wasn't worthy of what they gave me. If you look at how I be t treated them versus what I got back, uh, I'm very fortunate that my family still wants me in the family. And uh, some of the ways I made back to the family was um, when I was about six months sober, my mom was uh, diagnosed with emphysema. And uh, for the next it was 10 years, she suffered pretty much from that disease. And she, uh, not that she wasn't suffering before, we just finally figured out what was wrong with her. And she couldn't get up and do as much as she once could. And I come from a very large family, and and we get together for every reason imaginable, and there's food and all this involved. And I was uh, single at the time. And I started, the way I made amends to my mom was I knew she wanted to have these things, and she couldn't really leave her house because of her, her oxygen situation. And I would just say, well, Mom, why don't I come over and clean and cook? and uh, we could still have the party. And she loved it, and I was able to do that for her and for the family, you know, and she's gone five years, and I'm still cooking and cleaning, but um, <laughs> I guess that's my legacy, you know, and and uh, it's funny because uh, one of my uh, brothers-in-law who didn't know me when I was drinking, he only came on the scene afterwards, says, well, why do you feel the need to do all this? I was I don't think I can explain it, but I don't mind doing it, you know. <laughs> and uh, and it's little things like that. And, you know, I, I shared uh, when I was telling you about my story about how I kind of left my brother flat when his wife was delivering their first child. And, uh, you know, there's nothing uh, that goes on in my family that um, – to the best of my ability that I don't try to be supportive and be present for, physically present and emotionally and spiritually present. Uh, you know, when, when I had family members in the hospital uh, when I was drinking, I would go because you got to go. But I wasn't there. And I was, you know, kind of like a whirling dervish rolling into the place with balloons and flowers and blah, 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 blah telling jokes. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, go and off to the bar and and you know now I can go and uh, my, my sister's been very sick uh, recently and uh, I can go sit in the hospital with her and just sit and be I didn't know how to sit still before I couldn't do that I only learned how to sit still since I'm coming here and uh, you know it's little things like that and uh, you know just knowing what's going on in my nephew's lives and calling him up and say how's such and such going and, 
you know, uh, recently, uh, my nephew did very well on the SATs and I was like the first person he called. Uh, that felt good. That felt really good. And, uh, it also cost me money because we had a bet, but that might be why he called me. But, um, <laughs> gotta be honest. But, uh, I think I was, uh, he just got early accepted into Princeton, and I think I was just as proud as his parents, you know what I mean? And, uh, I mean, it's great being an aunt. All the pleasures of children without actually having them. But, um, you know, it's a beautiful thing. But, you know, these are the things, and, it, and it's about um, being there for a friend. When they tell you that same sad story for the 33rd time, because they're not done talking about it, to not looking bored irritated or oh god I'm here again because they they were there for me and listened to me tell the 33rd telling of a story until I got sick of hearing it. I was like oh please I can't tell you this story again you know that type of thing and, and changing my behavior overall with all people that I interact with um, when when I was drinking I lied because it was what I did I would lie even if there was like no good reason to. It's just what came out naturally. And I, I, I don't lie today. I don't actively lie. I'm still guilty of, you know, not telling somebody an outfit's disgusting when they ask my opinion. I'm not going to do that. I think that's a little brutal. But, uh, you know, and yes, I love that hair, Joe. Uh, but, but, but I don't lie, you know, and and the thing is, is that was a process too. You know, I didn't walk into AA and become a uh, Jolly Girl Scout. Um, I think I was like sober two years and I was coming back from a speaking commitment with my sponsor and another woman and we were sharing war stories and that stuff in traffic. And I'm in the middle of this pretty good story of mine. And I, I see I have their attention and I go, I got to stop. I'm like, what? You just get, I said, no, 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 we have to stop this now. I said, what's the matter? I said, I have been telling this story for years, and it has never happened. I have to stop now. <laughs> so over two years. You know, it was part of my repertoire. I mean, I had to give that up, you know? I mean, these, these are the things, you know, and it's like, it's a process. It's slow. God's kind. Um, you know, I, I, I'd love to tell you that all those amends were smooth. Uh, I tried to make amends to one friend who, to this day, will not speak to me. Uh, and we're part of a clique from, like, the high school era. So, like, when he comes into town, people have to choose what to do. And I always tell them, go see him. It's okay if I don't go. I don't want to cause any stress to him or my friends because of my past behavior. Does it hurt a little? Yeah, it's good hurt. When I think of picking up a drink, I think of that hurt. Because that's what happens when I drink. That's what happens when I don't follow steps. I hurt that guy sober. Um, but, and I, during a period where I wasn't following the steps fully. So, you know, these aren't necessarily bad things when your amends aren't accepted. It's, it's God's way of telling me it wasn't working out there. You can't right all things. Some things cannot be righted. You may be alright with it, but you may not be ever be able to right it with that person. That's the price of a drink for you. It's not a bad thing. It's just the, it's just what happened to me. Um, you know, I had this kind of notion when I first came here that, you know, I gave up alcohol. I'm going to walk in the park every day. The train will wait for me in the morning. No matter what restaurant I go to, the coffee will taste good. You know, all love relationships will end when I end them. You know, no, that wasn't my experience. Uh, everybody I love will never die. You know, no, that's not what happened. You know, but uh, the difference is um, I was there with the people when they went. I had cleaned my slate with them long before they went, not two minutes before they go in the hospital. Let me get this in before you go, selfish me. No, it was done long before that. And uh, that's what this step gave me. Um, my friend Amory that I told you about, uh, I was like two years sober. She passed away. And uh, 
I hadn't gotten up to her in my ninth step yet. And I felt she died rather unexpectedly for me. They knew she was going. I didn't believe them. She died very quickly of a very rapid disease. And I thought, like, very good, and I thought, two months ago, she's fine. These dramatic things. And then I'm going to the wake, you know. And uh, so that's not, like, particularly great sort of behavior, but that's where I was at the time. And uh, I talked to my sponsor. I didn't get to her. And she's like, well, you know what you're going to do. Um, I bet, you know, you, you're going to tell her how much you thank her for everything you did. she did in your life. Why don't you tell her mom at her wake how important her daughter was in your life? Like, you really think that's the place? She was, when else would be the place? You know, I was like, oh, okay. And I told her mom all these great things her daughter had done for me, and uh, it, it t- really touched her mom. I saw it. She was touched. She was, so I didn't know. These were, like, great things about her daughter. She didn't know. You know, and if I were still drinking, I never would have fessed up to stuff like that. I never could have talked about it. You know, these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, it really is a, a day at a time process. And, you know, I, I shared with you that I went through, um, oh, before I get to that, uh, when I first came into AA, um, I didn't follow one of the suggestions, like take the steps in order and uh, with help. Uh, so I, I was sober about a month and, uh, Two weeks before that, I had moved out of my parents' house. I had um, was wait, going into an apartment with my brother because we were starting to get grief at home for our drinking. So we got an apartment together. And in between when we paid for this apartment and when we moved in, I, like, landed in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, now I'm, like, trying to get sober with my drinking buddy, brother. And... Uh, you know, I'm sober about a month, and I it's a Saturday morning at, like, 9 o'clock, and me, that's like an odd combination, and I stopped by my mom's house. I called her, I said, I'm going to bring over the paper, you want to have coffee with me? She was, where are you? You know, because, you know, really, me, 9 o'clock in the morning, coffee in the paper, it's not, come on now. She was like, yeah, come on over. She was, I'm sure she was expecting me to show up with a shiner or something, and, uh, and I see her looking at me like, what's with you? You know, and I say, how you doing? She's like, so what are you doing up somewhere? I said, oh, I've been up since seven. She's really, you know. You know She's just like, ooh, you know. And uh, and I'm starting to look at my watch. She was looking at your watch. I said, yeah, i got to be somewhere at 1030. She goes, really? Where? So I said, well, I'm going to an AA meeting. She goes, where? And I said, I'm going to an AA meeting. She says, Why? This was the same woman who, like, six weeks earlier was yelling at me because I came in yet again in the middle of the night, left the front door open, and the refrigerator door open because I would be thirsty, but I would never close that door, and um, fell asleep again on my bed with my suit and my, my thing and one shoe off and one shoe left in the cab. She forgot. Why are you going to AA? And I did something really crazy. I told her why. And she had this, like, look of horror when I started telling her why I was going to AA. And I went, you know, I think I've said too much. Um, I wish I could take it back, but I think I need to go now. And she was like, well, I think you should go there. You know, and it was just like, fine. You know, and... You know, I wish that was the extent of the damage, but I have to admit that um, she ended up uh, sharing with me that she felt responsible that I became an alcoholic. And for as long and as hard as I tried to dissuade her of that opinion, I don't think she ever fully 100% bought that she wasn't responsible, much as I tried. And I just think I told her five minutes of, like, the not-so-bad part of my story, it's a good thing I stopped that day. You know, I I can't undo what I did. So by not following the suggestions, by going off on my own Lisa Reese way, I hurt somebody sober, somebody I love dearly, my mom, you know. And, you know, I only share that not because I'm proud of it, but if you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking, oh, i got to let people know what's going on, easy. 
Talk to somebody first. Somebody with a clue. Somebody not you. You know, that's really, you know, what you need to do. And, and I, I, I can never take back what I did. And I know that she's in a better place now and knows better. And I think she came around quite a bit with it, but it was a process. And, uh, and I can't undo that, but, um, it's just another reminder of why I need to follow the suggestions that are put in front of me. And uh, I'd love to tell you, after all that work that I talked to you about doing, oh, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. <sighs> Which I would love, you know. I would love to work a recovery program on my couch, um, <laughs> sports, and snacks. I would love that. Me and the Super Bowl. The boys on TV, not shows in a soda. There you go. But that's not my experience. My experience is I go on living, I go on hurting, go on not hurting. And uh, for a while, I kind of got off the spiritual beat. And uh, I fortunately didn't pick up a drink. I, I don't know why that happened. I, I have to just think that, you know, God is good. God knows... Uh, that I couldn't have survived it, maybe. I don't know. But I, I certainly was miserable enough, again, in AA to go through the steps a second time. And uh, I had this notion that I already made amends for, and those people, well, I'm done with them. But see, something happened to me. Um, the longer I stayed around, more was revealed to me. And they talk about that, more being revealed. And... Uh, you know, I, I eventually had made amends with my mom and in a more appropriate way. Uh, my story then disclosed in a general way as opposed to a specific. And, you know, I learned a couple of things. I learned a little bit about discretion. And um, and yet, I think I was sober five years, and I was visiting my mom, and I was heading out the door. And she said to me, uh, you know, I don't worry about you anymore. Uh and my first reaction was, really, that's great, Mom, I'm, I'm happy. And I walked out and said, did I even think about that she worried about me? You self-centered SOB. All you thought about was what you could remember how you hurt her. That woman stayed up so many nights waiting for me. And even after I moved out of the house, what is she up to now? I haven't heard from her in three weeks. Um, I, my first marriage, I had uh, separated from my husband at one point uh, because of something you really should separate about and um, and we'll just leave it at that and uh, and I uh, I moved out I moved into uh, an apartment that one of my other brothers was living in I said don't tell anybody where I am you know nothing oh yeah I was the one wrong so I don't want to have to tell the story of why I separated and uh, my mom found out that I, w I had left my husband because she called the house like two weeks later just like to talk. And he's like, she doesn't live here anymore. She says, what? She doesn't live here anymore. She hasn't lived here for two weeks. She left. I don't know where she is, but she's not here. And she called me at work the next day. And, sh and she was like, oh, you're there. I said, well, yeah. She was, I called your house last night. You don't live there anymore. And I was like, yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it, I mean, this woman that whole night must have worried about me. And I put my brother in the awful situation of don't say anything to anybody. I, I mean, this is how I lived out there. I don't care about you. Just what's good for me for today. I wasn't up to talk. I was up to drinking about it. I wasn't up to talking about it. Just. These are the way I hurt people. So I've already made amends to this woman, and now this stuff is coming back to me. Well, like I said, I was a blackout drinker, and I, I was a convenience to get her, and uh, more things are being revealed. So now I have to write these things out and go through that process again. i got to tell you, it's embarrassing going back to the same people. I left some things out. I'm going through the steps again, and I realize that I didn't do a full review of my relationship with you, and I need to come back to you on a few things. I don't think I've ever been more embarrassed in my life, you know. I, I just haven't. 
but um, it's what I needed to do. And uh, and I think I'm getting ready to go through them again because memory sucks. I'm sorry. I'd let, where do I check to get it all? Because things are starting to come back to me. Many years later, I've gone through the steps twice already. And things are starting to come back to me. It's like, oh, and something didn't come back to me. Uh, about two months ago, I'm over at my sister's house, and, you know, everybody's there. It's like one of the kids' birthday parties, and my sister's like, oh, yeah, and that time I had to pick you up from the cops. I'm like, what? You know, that time the cops made me come pick you up right away or they were going to arrest you. I'm like, sure it was me. <laughs> sure it wasn't like Ricky or Chris or Adele. Sure it was me. I don't remember this. And I told her, I don't remember this. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Why would she think it was me? She wasn't a drinker. I mean, she had no reason to forget who she went to pick up. I don't recall any of this. So, yeah, you're over, in, you know, by the park there. I was like, that's where I hung out at that time. That's a possibility. And I'm thinking, you know. And I was like, really? She was, yeah, me and Daddy came and got you. I'm like, really? And, you know, my first thing was like, no, this didn't happen. You know, and, and I just said to her, I can't imagine you have any reason to lie to me. I guess this happened. I don't recall any of it. And, you know, I could have went to my grave not recalling it. I'm sorry we had this discussion today, but, uh, I'm, you know, and, and we laughed, and I said, but I, I imagine you really worried about me a lot, and, uh, I'm sorry I put you through that. And, uh, and yet I know that's not enough. I need to go back and do some extra work on that. And a couple of things have come up recently where, uh, I've thought about people who, I hurt in ways that never got on my first or second list. And that's all been happening in the last couple of months. So I just feel like I'm at a new level and more is being revealed. And, and I have to think that um, as long as I stay in this process that we call recovery, that more will continue to be revealed to me, that that's just the – that's part and parcel with what I'm doing here and that um, – I think God's been kind to me because if all this stuff was put in front of me all at once, I may not have been able to handle it, you know, and, and he gave it to me as as I could stand it, so to speak. And um, I, <laughs> I'm just very grateful for um, the ability that I have had to repair damaged relationships in my life. You know, paying back the creditors, paying back the old job, that was important to do. But the real benefit for me that I've gotten from this work so far, and I imagine I'll continue to get, is being able to repair the important relationships in my life. Um, when I was um, about seven years sober, um, my brother, who I had had that apartment with, um, died. But he was in the hospital for about five months before he went. And I, uh, for the first time in my life, I'd gotten fired from a job at that time. Never got fired from a job drinking. I got fired from a job sober. And I hated the job. It was like a blessing. But I was just mad that they fired me and I didn't quit, you know. It's all about that, you know. I hate being the, the dumpy. I'm sorry. Whether it's in, you know, work. Love, friendship, I don't like being a dumpy. I will never openly embrace that part of a transaction. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll get through it with God's help, but no, 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 come dump me. No, I'm not there. Sorry. I understand I'll learn from it. Thank you very much, but uh, where do I check no thanks, you know? But, um, you know, at the time, I was feeling sorry for myself. I'm out of work. And my brother gets in the hospital, and I'm like, well, I'm getting on employment. I'm not going to go back to work. So I went to the hospital every day and was able to be with him all day. And, uh, you know, we had already made amends a couple of years before that. Um, I had tried it in the first round, but he didn't want to talk to me. Because, <laughs> you know, um, we had gotten to a point where, you know, I knew he was sick from this disease and he was still partying. He kept bouncing uh, in and out of AA but couldn't get it. And I just told him, I, I cannot... I can't live with you anymore. 
can't watch you kill yourself. I don't have it. I'll leave if you want. You could leave. It doesn't matter to me. I can't do this. And I'd come to that point because I, I was finding I, I, I was losing the love of my heart for him because I was getting mad at him on a daily basis for what he was doing. And, and uh, he had interpreted that, that I was abandoning him at his darkest hour. But that wasn't his darkest hour by any stretch. And uh, ultimately, I was able to make amends with him. And we had, he, had, he had finally come around to understand that uh, I wasn't abandoning him so much as trying to protect myself from my sobriety. And we came to terms, you know, a couple of years before he died. And we had a great relationship again on a different plane. And um, when he was in the hospital those last five months, um, there was a problem uh, when he had gotten admitted. And when they put something in the stores to help him breathe that night, he lost his voice box. He wasn't able to talk. And my brother loved to talk. And he was very animated. And, you know, he was just a funny guy. And... Uh, he managed to get his message across with the inability to write. He couldn't talk, but man, those eyes were a fluttering, man. And we'd be in that, and he'd be like, you know, and, and we just had a great five months together. He was suffering, but we were still able to communicate. And I was able to advocate for his health and um, make hard decisions and have hard conversations. Um, he was suffering. He was in pain, but he couldn't speak for himself. And uh, I said, oh, you're in pain, right? And I'm looking at the thing, and I see he's not getting pain for And I'm like, they're not giving you anything for the pain. So I talked to the doctor about it. And the doctor said to me, well, you know, if uh, we give him painkillers, it's going to affect his lungs, and he's going to die sooner. I'm thinking, and suffer less, right? But that's not for me to choose. So I went to my brother, and I had this conversation with him. Of course, the reason they're not giving you painkillers is because if they give you painkillers, it'll affect your lungs and you'll die sooner. Do you want to die sooner and have less pain, or do you want to hang on? What do you want? I could have never had that conversation drinking. Never. I had to, t you know, I'm able to talk to people about what's going on now. I don't run from anything today. And, and he was able to tell me, get me out of here, whatever it takes, no pain. And I went, and I got that doctor, and I told him what happened. And I go back to the desk the next day, and no pain colors. Like he gave him one set. And I was able to go and find the people I had to find and tell them, this is the conversation I had with my brother, and this is what you need to do. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't throw anything. I didn't raise my voice. And they actually responded because I wasn't a nut. You know, those kind of things. And uh, to me, that's living a mess. Dealing with people as things are going on. I never knew how to do that. I don't want to know what you're feeling. Please. I don't even want to know what I'm feeling. Don't tell me. You know, that kind of stuff. I, I don't live like that today. You know, there are times people tell me stuff, and I'm like, wow, that's too much information. But it's okay. Because I have a place to take that stuff. I can take it to God. I can take it to another alcoholic. I can take it to my husband. Some people don't have anybody else. So, yeah, I'll listen. I don't really want, to see, I didn't really want to know that, but that's okay. I'll probably forget it anyway. It'll go away. You know, but I, I can be there for people today, and I, I really think that's, like, the biggest freedom that I got. And, uh, you, you know, I, I've i been sober uh, a little over, well, next month will be 15 years. And, you know, since I'm sober, I buried my best friend, my brother, and my two parents. And... Um, I grieved for their loss, but I didn't really have, if only I had. But I never got to, you know. And uh, I remember um, the, I was in the hospital one day with my dad, and uh, he was getting, he had been uh, beaten up and he was getting, we were in the emergency room, and I'm sitting with him, and, uh, you know, I hear a lot of commotion at one of the other things, and uh turns out somebody's mother died. And 
two minutes later, this woman comes in screaming, I didn't get to say I'm sorry. I didn't get to say I'm sorry. And I was just like, oh, thank you, God. I mean, it really made me not happy for what happened to this woman and whatever path she's got to go through to fix that. But I don't mean to diminish that, but I was just like, that's the difference. That's the difference. I don't have to have unfinished business. I don't have to wait till some day to handle it. Today is the day you handle it. Now. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not someday. What I'm talking about. Immediately we. Suddenly we. Then we. You know, like it says in the book. Not, oh, it took six months off. Didn't want to feel, do, or see anything. And, you know, no. That's not recovery. That's like, you know. That's just a, a recipe for, um, at a minimum, misery and possibly a drink and then death, jail or institution. But, uh, you know, because of this step, I can walk in any place I used to run in and not be, people so and so are coming up. <laughs> I better walk down this block. I don't, I don't live like that today. And, and there are some people who um, I have not encountered yet to make amends to. Um, I don't know where they are. doesn't matter. But um, if they were to be presented to me, I would make amends to them. I'm not afraid of them. I can go anywhere. I'm not afraid of any conversations I'm going to have with them. I used to be afraid of everything. As a result of this, I'm not afraid of anything. I mean, I'm afraid of real things. If you put a loaded gun in my head. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get scared, but like dealing with people used to frighten me to death. And going into a bad neighborhood at three in the morning to get something didn't. You know, now it's the other way. Now I'm, you know, wow, I don't want to drive to the future in this day. And I hung out here. You know, it's just totally different. And, uh, you know, beautiful things happen. You know, when I, I just want to talk about one other experience. When I first came in to AA, I was, uh, separated for the second and final time from my first husband. Uh, I've only had two, so I don't want to sound like Elizabeth Taylor or anything. But, um, And I hated this guy. I hated him, like, as deep as you can. And uh, during our uh, adventure called marriage, we had amassed a lot of debts, but they were in my name. And now I'm sober and I'm paying my bills. And cursing this guy on a monthly basis, writing the checks, die. Where's you? Where are your money? You, know? you should die, you know? And uh, one night during one of these love fests, my phone rings, and it's Annie. And I'm like, yeah, what's with you? I'm just writing my bill. And she's like, so why do you sound like you're insane? I said, oh, you don't understand. I'm blah, 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 blah. She's like, oh, wait a minute. You have a job, right? Yeah. You could afford to pay these bills. Yeah. You don't want that guy in your life anymore, right? No. Oh, you need to bless him. You need to bless your job and your ability to pay the bill. And don't forget to bless the check. Plus this. I could be doing something with this money. I said, oh, no, no, you need to do this. Yeah, all right, thank you very much. You know, I had to pray for him to get everything in his life that I want in mine. Yeah, all right. I pray that you get everything you deserve. We'll leave the results up to God. You know, and and I slowly, slowly came around, and he, in fact, was the first person I made amends to. And, you know, I'd love to tell you that I made amends entirely and didn't remember anything he had did to me. I didn't mention anything he did to me, but I didn't necessarily forget. And it took me a little bit of, it really took to the second time going through that I got fully rid of it. And, uh, I, I mean, I really came in thinking he owes me. And, uh, about three months ago, he called me to make amends. And, uh, I was like, I don't need this call now. I could care less. <laughs> you know, I was like, I wanted that call 15 years ago. Where were you when I needed it? You know? And uh, and, and we had a, I just said to him, you know, uh, I'll listen to whatever you have to say, but I have forgiven and forgotten everything at this point, and I wish you nothing but the best. 
you know, and I, I hang up and I tell my you know, husband number two about it. He goes, did he offer you any money? And <laughs> I said, apparently that's not part of his program. But um, I said, it didn't even occur to me to ask him for money because that's not where I'm coming from today. I don't care that one spent. You know, and, and I just share that because it just talks, you know, it just takes one relationship through the thing. Uh, at any rate, um, I can talk all night, but I won't. You know, fear less. I will not talk all night. And um, my my life has uh, slowly been transformed because of the steps in this program. And the only reason it's been slowly is because I move slowly, not because the steps do. And I want to be very clear about that. When I work, results happen. When I don't, I sit in misery. Um, but uh, the reality is if you don't pick up a drink, there's always hope to do the work. And... Uh, Again, thank you very much for listening. I'd like now to introduce our guest speaker of the month of January, and uh, she'll be speaking on steps uh, 10, 11, and 12, and that will be Lisa R. Good evening. My name is Lisa Risi, and I am an alcoholic. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, it's good that it's the last week. Uh, but I am very happy to be here, and uh, this has been uh, an honor and a privilege, and, uh, and I've gotten a lot out of this experience. I was talking to some folks before I came here tonight. I mentioned that uh, actually uh, before this month I had never spoken for an entire hour at a meeting in my life. And uh, when I got up in front of the microphone the first night, uh, I said my name and thank. <laughs> and I had a momentary thought that it was going to be a long month. <laughs> and uh, and it was going to be me, Mike, and Kathy by week four. And, uh, <laughs> and that after that, they'd probably never speak to me again. Uh, but I, I you know, said a quick prayer, and you know he took over, and all was well. Uh, but uh, I'd recommend this to anybody. And uh, it, it's all kidding aside, uh, it, it's been a really good experience for me uh, to share my experience in this way. And, and I, uh, I'll always be grateful to this group for giving me that opportunity. Um, because I, I cannot pay back to Alcoholics Anonymous the gift that it has given to me. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, well, we left off last week, I feel like, I don't know, a weekly talk show host or something, but we left off last week. You know, I just like, this is a, a wild way we do things here. I love it. Uh, we're, uh, made, made peace with people in my life. Uh, snapshot in time now and now I have to continue to live my life and that's that's what 10 11 and 12 are for me to continue to live my life uh, I don't believe they're maintenance steps I don't want to maintain anything uh, no thank you I've seen that happen to people it's not pretty and I don't want it for me and uh, at times it has happened for me and it's it's a lot less pretty when I have to live it uh, I'm going to talk first about the 10th step. Continue to take personal inventory when we're wrong, promptly admit it. Uh, that was uh, an interesting philosophy. Uh, <laughs> continue. 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 Daily. It's a new philosophy for me. Cause I'm the, my whole life I've been the, all right, let's do what we got to do, work hard for two weeks, and then coast for about a year. But this daily thing is kind of, uh, you know, it's an encumbrance. It's every day. And I don't do every day well. I'm not, a, by nature, a consistent person. But uh, I was, uh, well, I said I was brought up well in this program, uh, my first sponsor required that I call her every day. And uh, 
He says, but do me a favor. Could you call me after you've prayed and been to a meeting? <laughs> You're a little easier to handle. All right. So I had this habit of when I got out of the meeting, I would call her outside of the diner because I had to go to the diner every night. You know I had to, right? You know. It was the only semblance of a social life available at the time, so I was going. But she had a life and had to go to bed at 10, so I had to call her from the, you know, out in the cold at the phone booth outside the diner, you know. I didn't have a cell phone back then. I don't even know if there were cell phones. Back then. But if they did, they were like 400 pounds, so that wouldn't have worked. And, uh, and I would call her with my tales of woe for the day. It was very rarely the tales of hoopla. It was the tales of woe. Because I was miserable. And, uh, and, you know, I would call her and I'd be like, you know, this and that's bothering me, this and that, and I messed this up. But, you know, and I would go in thinking, you know, these people really made a victim out of me today. And, but, and in this case, I, I don't know what I was doing. I was wrong there. And then after I got off the phone with her, I wasn't a victim. I was a volunteer. I had set the stage for that situation. And there were 14 places along the way I could have stepped off that trolley car. And the one or two things I, I actually thought I got wrong weren't quite as wrong as I thought. And that those were the couple of things I was getting right. But they were so not natural to me, I thought they were wrong. So that was my first introduction to this. She didn't tell me we were doing any kind of inventory. I was just telling her about my day. And then um, as I started working on my fourth step, before that she had me starting with my daily inventory. And uh, she gave me this assignment to, so let's just keep it with the resentment at first. I want you to write down any resentment you have during the day, and we'll talk about it. And uh, I don't know what the hell she was talking about. She explained it, but I, I don't know what she was talking about. Going around, and I, I'd get agitated during the day, and I'd think, oh, was that a resentment? I don't know. You know, I... Uh, so that doesn't seem like strong enough to be a resentment. Uh, that's an annoyance. Does that go on the list? Um, I don't know. Uh, this is annoying me. Annie's going on the list. That's who's on the list, Annie. So the first day she gives me the assignment, I call her and tell her, you're on the list. Because I don't know what I'm doing, and it's your fault. And uh, she laughed. And we walked, and I said, you know, and I have these things that were annoyances. And she was like, oh, easy, easy, easy. Who did you interact with today? What did you say? What did you do? How did you feel? I'd rather tell you who I slept with this morning than all of that. You know, really, that, that's me, you know. So we go through this. And, uh, and I said, oh, okay. She said, uh, you know, in these situations, she would point out where I had Plenty of opportunity to, to leave the troubles behind me, but I was just kind of like, once I was on a roll, off I went. You know, I was like, forget it. The train went no brakes. And uh, she started introducing me to pray while it's happening. Don't pray afterwards. It's not as helpful. You know, okay. Um, and she was like, uh, you know, you're getting agitated a lot during the day. Um, Maybe you need to write things down as they're happening. Go get yourself a little memo pad and throw yourself in the ladies' room when it happens. Well, a lot of it was around work at the time. They really didn't value me enough. And um, they really had no idea what a gem they had. And, um, <laughs> oh, man. And, uh, you know, and on a daily basis, I had a resentment against my lunchtime meeting and uh, three people at my home group. And, and whatever. And uh, I didn't go through this. And, uh, you know, even I had to see it's getting quite boring. The same people, same crap every day. And uh, she's like, you can't change those situations. You can't change them. You can't change these things. I said, I know. <laughs> she's like, you can change what you bring. That means I'm responsible for that. I saw where she was going with that. And uh, I didn't like it. And she was like, 
Until you start looking at your part, you're never going to be free. Never going to be free. I want to be free. I'm going to look at my part. And uh, it really changed the whole way I looked at my life. And uh, I haven't been a victim for years. I haven't been a victim for years. I've been one stupid SOB many times over again. But I have not been a victim. And uh, any situation I get myself into that forces me to ride an inventory, there I am. It's not you. It's me. You could be. You could have done the worst thing in the world to me. What? How did I react? Did I react in kind? Oh, that's lovely. That's what God would have me do. You know, I had to learn to look at things a little differently. And there were some situations where I got really novel approaches to things. If I kept finding myself in a situation with certain people, and no matter how I changed my behavior, they were still behaving in a way that wasn't good for me, I could stop spending time with them. I mean, this was like brain surgery. I just never knew. You know, I, I just never knew this stuff. This was simple stuff. It was coming out of daily inventories. It was amazing. And, uh, you know, and that was the beginning of a process. And, uh, and I had to take it with somebody. I had to tell them. <laughs> me taking my inventory with me? Where's that going to get me? I'm right. They are wrong. They don't understand. I mean, you know, I, I shared why, why you need a person in the fifth step. I really believe if you if you woke me up in the middle of the night, I'd tell you I am thin and 27 years old. That's what I want to believe about me. So if I can't see something that, like, a stranger on the street can see about me, I think I need a little help with my inventory. I can't take – I can take my own inventory, but if I'm the only one looking at it, it's not going to be too good. Because rationalization will come in. Oh, I don't need to write that down. I don't need to look at that. You know, this writing business is overrated. I don't need to write every day. You know, I, I, I've been practicing this for years. I have a gut instinct now. If I can't sleep at night, then I need to do an inventory. This is the kind of stuff I can tell myself left to me. You know, and stuff that I have told myself at different times in my sobriety and had to pay for it. I, I, to date, haven't had to pay for it with a drink, but um, I have damaged relationships because of that thinking and that behavior. I have uh, lost one friendship because of that behavior, and I have done stuff that, um, for a long time, that could have been cut a lot sooner had I been taking a valid inventory. And that, that's what it's there for me. That's why it's there for me. It's not work. When I first came into AA, I thought the steps were like the punishment I had to pay for, a lot, for the life of Riley I was living out there. I thought this was like, oh, now i got to do this work because, you know, what I did. This stuff is here to free me. This is here to give me my life back. And even more than that, because I certainly have a better life today than I ever had. And, um, you know, there's uh, a gentleman who... Uh, who helped me out a lot in the beginning. And, uh, you know, when I was telling him about writing my inventory at the end of the day, he was like, oh, yeah, he was, uh, you're alone in your room, on your knees praying, and then you write. I said, yes. Yeah. What's the last time you were alone in your room praying to God? You hurt somebody. Huh? Maybe, maybe you need to be doing that all day. <laughs> maybe you need to be taking your inventory all day, not at the end of the day. And the truth was, I needed to be taking it at a couple of times during the day because when I was new, I uh, I would read like daily meditation material and five minutes later forget what I read. So of course I'm going to forget who I got into an altercation with at 10:15 this morning. Ah, oh, please, you got to be kidding me! I, I mean, it wasn't like I was having one altercation per day at the time. You know, it was like I was out there bouncing off of people and situations. You know. You know, if you only did one crazy thing, it's easy to take your inventory. But I had a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of people out in that world, you know. In my way. I am so nuts. And, um, and I blow. And, uh, 
uh, and that that's been a process that uh to be quite honest uh for me is a litmus test for how my sobriety is doing. If I'm writing my inventory during the day or at the end of the day and sharing it with either my sponsor or another alcoholic, I'm generally doing okay. I'm doing okay. If I'm not, I'm just kind of getting by. Bobbing and weaving, doing a little, just enough, the stuff that's really eating at me, I got to tell you, so I don't drink. But, I mean, there's a big span in there. And, uh, and I've practiced every level of that span. And the one that works best for me is the one where I'm writing it down on a daily basis and sharing it with someone. And it's gotten to the point where I really don't care who I share it with as long as they have recovery principles in their lives. Because, you know, I love my husband dearly, but, I mean, I go to jail for the stuff he thinks is solutions to my problems, you know. I love this guy, but he doesn't help me, you know. He's very supportive, and I know he's in my corner, and, you know, he'll be coming every Sunday with the cake. But, you know, I, I need somebody who's going to find the solution for me, not land me in, uh, you know, whatever the current version of jail is. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a balancing act because, uh, you know, we, we have different principles. And uh, I find that when I take my inventory with him, you know, I can get away with murder. So I don't go there. And uh, there are certain things I should just never share with him anyway. But, uh, you know, it is a process. And I find that by sharing my inventory with people, uh, sometimes I'm reminding them what they need to be doing. And I'll maybe bring up something that's bothering them, and maybe we help each other. Because the fellowship is very important to me. Um, you know, uh, I am very book-oriented. I believe in the steps. I believe that the power comes from God. But I don't think there is no value in the fellowship. Uh, you know, it talks through the book, the fellowship that we crave. I crave fellowship. I've craved some interesting fellowship over my life. But... <laughs> I crave fellowship, and I get a lot more out of sharing what's going on with me on a daily basis with other alcoholics who are trying to live in recovery than I do by not sharing my life. I, it's just I get a lot more out of it. And, uh, you know, some of the best meetings happen in the car on the way to and from the meeting uh, for me. Uh, that one-on-one, -on -one, one alcoholic sharing with another. There's just something about that. And uh, taking my inventory with another alcoholic is a big part of that for me. And, uh, and I, I can't, uh, I can't stress enough how important that is to making positive, forward motion in your life. And if that's what you want, that's what you kind of need to do. That's what I need to do. And. Uh, you know, I strongly believe that on a daily basis, we're either moving toward a drink or further away from one. There is no standing still. There is no maintaining a spot. It just doesn't work. Uh, I'm a malcontent by nature. I have the attention span of a gnat. I bore easily. I need to be moving forward at all times or I'm out there drinking. It's just a matter of time. Now, I'll do some other things first, I imagine. You know, there's a couple of other, you know, defects of character I'll pick up before the drink. I was at a meeting last week, and it was a seven-step meeting, and the guy talked about defects of character, and he said, I don't really like that term. I'm thinking, yeah, who does? <laughs> I prefer to think of it as mistakes I'm very likely to make. <laughs> I, I, I identified with that guy. There are some mistakes I'm very likely to make. They were all over my thoughts then. They continue to be in my head stop, but at a lesser degree and thankfully at less frequency. So there is positive improvement uh, 
you know, if I had to say to you it's so many years later and it's the same stuff, then this doesn't work. But if I don't keep fit, there are certain things that are just going to start popping up. And for me, it's um, gossip. Imagining I'm being slighted in situations I'm not being appreciated enough. Don't they know what a gem they have? Whether that's my boss, my family, my husband, or whoever. Don't they know what I bring to the table? Uh, you know, those kinds of things. And, uh, and if practice long enough, not taking inventory can lead me to overspending, um, wandering eye uh, hasn't led me to a wandering body since I'm in AA. Something is working, but the eye is just as dangerous. And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, we all have something. We all have something. And it may be slightly different from one person to another, but we all suffer from those five things, whatever they are for you, that come up when we're not doing what we need to be doing. And uh, I know mine. I can't not know them. You know, it's like even I can't deny them at this point. You know, they're mine. And uh, and the reason they still exist is because there's some part of me that is still holding on to them. And uh, I don't believe any way, shape, or form that God is holding back his grace from me. I believe there's something I'm doing or not doing. That's making them still be available to exist. And that's why I need this inventory. And hopefully, uh, after a while, even I'll get sick of this stuff enough that, you know, I'll actually honestly ask for his help. It's a process. And, uh, you know, it, it really is not natural for me to look at my part in things. Uh, it is a little bit of work. Um, and, you know, it's a lot easier at the end of a long day. <laughs> Catch you in the morning, God. Thanks. Thanks for a good one. It's not like I haven't done that, you know. That's why I have those words. Uh, and I've done it, you know. And, uh, you know, and, and he is kind, and he does give me his grace, and I'm still here sober in spite of that. But um, my, my life has been transformed through the process of continuing to take my personal inventory. Um, and uh, anyone who's sitting here tonight and is sober but is looking at their life, uh, it's, you know, it's good, but... Kind of missing something. I wish you could be a little better. This is the first part of getting closer to your higher power at this point in your recovery. Uh, it's a, I have to cleanse myself again to get into his grace. His grace is available, but I can't see it, touch it, taste it if I don't clean my slate. And that's what this process is for me. And... Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but uh, when I'm done doing my 10th step, there's nowhere to go but God. That's why 11 comes after it. You know, it's like, come on. You know, somebody with a clue put these steps together, okay? And after I look at January 30th, 2000, look at my inventory. Let's open the book. Let's go back. Oh, that's gone. That's, well, that's still there. That's, that's when I have to go to God, because he's the one with the power. He's the only one with the power. I'll share it with another individual, but the answer is always to go to God. That's the only answer I have. No other answer has worked. And so that's why we have an 11. It tells me to, to seek through prayer and meditation to improve my contact with God. It assumes I've already had a contact. Well, I have. All throughout the steps in 2 and in 3 and 5 and 6 and 7. So the relationship started way back. But it's like any other relationship in my life. 
if I want a relationship with you, I have to spend time with you. I've got to be with you. I've got to be in communion with you. If I met somebody, person-wise, who, whenever I saw them, was always in a good mood, fun to be with, anything I needed, they provided, always loved me, no matter what I did, you know, I'd be stepping on you to get to that person. That's what God does for me. I, if, if I would go following you around like a flea, that's what I need to do with my higher power. You know, and the first person I felt that way about was my first sponsor. When she stopped short, my nose hit her behind. I wanted to be with her. She was the first God I had in this program. You know, but she was good. She knew she wasn't God. She sent me to God. She's like, I'm going to fail you. You need God. You don't need me, you know. And uh, that's where I've been instructed to go, you know. And this isn't just like prayer and meditation to feel better. Well, you know, your life can be improved by prayer and meditation. No, it's telling me what to do. Paul's me saying only, only one thing, only. Now it's for as well. And the power to carry it out. I have to be honest, by the time I get to this step, God's will for me, in most cases, is very clear. There may be those handful of things, but in most cases, it's pretty clear what his will is for me. I mean, who are we kidding? You know, a lot of the gross behavior is gone. Now it's down to those last few things. And it's usually pretty clear what I need to do what each next right thing is. Where my difficulty comes as a human being is, oh, now i got to do it. You know, somebody was sharing before, you know, that God gives them the strength to do Kathy, to do the things she knows she has to do, that is right to do. But in the end, you're going to feel better about doing it. You know, that's the crazy part. The things that I believe are God's will for me may not immediately feel good, you know, which is what I want. I like the right now. I love living in the moment. I like the right now. But it's about how am I going to feel a day from now? I have options many times during the day to pick one way or another in a situation. And my natural instinct is, well, what's the easiest one for me to do right now? What's the one that doesn't require me getting off my fat behind? What's the one that doesn't make me vulnerable? What's the one that doesn't require me to put something I feel like doing right now on hold for a better good? That's the one I want first. But I know what I need to do. And what I need to do sometimes isn't easy to do immediately. And that's when I need to ask for God's strength and power and guidance. And, uh, you know, in, in spite of my experience, there are times where it's right in front of me. This is what you need to do. And if you don't, this is the price. And in spite of all that, there comes a time where I go, well, it's not so bad of a price. I think I could pay that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. That wasn't that expensive. That's not so bad. Until the bill comes. You know, and that bill comes in many different phases. Strained relations with people. You know, one of my favorites is, you know, I, I work in an organization where um, we're spread throughout the country. And uh, most of my communication is via email. And I would love to send little email bombs back to these people, you know, because they, they send stuff and you're like, I know they wouldn't talk like this to me face to face. You know, I just, you know, you look at this thing and say, they would not say this to me to my face. But they are 3,000 miles away and that's why they're saying it like that. And my first reaction is to respond in kind. And that has really gotten me into a lot of trouble. 
because now there's written evidence of it, you know? And, uh, and I've had to learn that when I receive an email that causes my blood pressure to go up and my desire to find the nastiest way to say something to as many people I can copy as possible, that, um, my solution is to walk away from my desk. And if I'm too busy for that, that's a disease telling me I'm too busy. If I walk away, chances are I just may not behave inappropriately. I sit at my desk and I say, you can't do this. You cannot respond. You cannot respond. God, please help me. God, please help me. And I say, wow, I'm not that better. I'm going to draft the response and not send it. And that's how I do it. I have a big draft file. And, and I enjoy it. And every now and then I open it because that was good. I wish I knew. I wish it would have been good if I sent that baby out. And uh, I, I learned about that draft file at a meeting. Somebody else shared about it. And I was like, hey, that could work because I'll get it out, but they don't need to hear it. It's a beautiful thing. Technology's helping me. You know? <laughs> and uh, I, I've learned with the really nasty ones, what I find particularly enlightening is I send back the sweetest message I can. Try to be as mo of as most service as I can. They have no idea that I'm like, oh, so not true. <laughs> and I don't feel this as I'm typing. That's how I go through. And, uh, you know, oddly enough, by behaving that way, calling in God's power just when I need it, I get the power. And people who, when I started there, I hated them. I don't know anybody who I hate that can't need to die. They can't just live elsewhere. They have to die. And uh, that hasn't gone away. Um, someday, right? Um, but some of those people... Because I've not responded in that way and I've actually tried to find solutions after praying, are like on my list of people I actually work well with today. Imagine that. I could hate somebody one day and another day be working well with them. And uh, that's just amazing. God's power is uh, well, more than I could ever explain in words. Um, I've been in a lot of situations where I've had to call on that power. And uh, God, God is great and God is good. Little kids' prayers are uh, right on. God is great and God is good. And, uh, you know, when I first came into AA, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, I was like a twitch, okay? I was just a twitch. And uh, I'm sure that had nothing to do with the 42 cups of coffee a day I was drinking and uh, the haagen bass pints, that was the post-meeting meal, you know, those kinds of things. And I was having a tough time sitting still, falling asleep at night, staying asleep when I got to sleep. So my first introduction to meditation was, Annie, I can't sleep. They say you, you sleep better when you come to AA. Well, not sleep better. Did, did they give you a date by which you would sleep? <laughs> no. Just hang in there. I, I, but I can't sleep. So I said, well, why don't you try meditating? Why don't I try flying a plane? I don't know how to meditate. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I knew I was taught as a kid how to pray, and everything I learned, they kind of threw out early in this process of I had to develop my own prayers and my own conversation with God, and that chances are a standard prayer I've been using for years, well, well, that didn't work for you, so maybe you need to try different prayers and find a different kind of way of talking. That went, like, exactly opposite to what I was taught as a child, and it was like, make up my own words to talk to for me? Hmm. Uh, sure that's allowed? I had a couple of nuns that would beg to differ. I, you know, 
I haven't been practicing that religion for a while, but you know, they you know, they've been around for thousands of years. <laughs> all right, so it's a little superstitious. All right, and uh, but but I had started praying on my own, and uh, I was given this lesson that a prayer sung is a prayer twice said. I like to sing. I have no talent, but I like to sing. And I kind of felt it was God's just rewards to get my prayers in the form of, in the form of my singing them to him because I, my voice sucks. And I want a good voice. And you give me this one, that's how I'm praying. I was really sick, all right? But I actually I still sing today, and I just think it's like God's joke, but, you know. The first time I, I sang to my husband, he said to me, Oh, did anybody ever tell you that you're a beautiful singer? I said, No. He goes, Well, there's a reason. <laughs> Should have known that. I was going to end up marrying him, right? But, uh, <laughs> but he didn't tell me not to sing anymore, right? So, it's a good thing. But, uh, so I started with praying, and then she's telling me that, you know, if I'm having trouble sleeping, maybe I can try to meditate. I told her, I, I don't, I don't know. The only meditating I ever seen was my brother, and that just seems, you know, it's some sort of transit. I don't know what he's doing, but it's, it's very weird. And I, I don't want to ask for his help, is bottom line. Yeah. So she said, you don't have to ask your brother for help. There's other people who meditate. Uh, I can help you. In fact, I have a tape that maybe you'll want to listen to this, to try. It's a very beginner. Well, it's okay. So I get this tape, and I'm like, okay, I can't sleep. I'm going to try meditating. So I put the tape in, and it had some really good instruction about the way to sit, the way to breathe, how to clear my mind. This guy had a very calm voice and was explaining everything. I fell asleep. I called him the next day. She was, oh, did you try that tape? I said, yeah, it don't work. She was, oh, really? I said, no, nah, I fell asleep. She was, you're sick. You called me because you needed help falling asleep. I give you a tape, you fall asleep, and you tell me it doesn't work. What did you expect it to do? You know, and I was like, I don't know. She had her hands full, that's for sure. And, um, you know. Well, I've had me back, so it's okay. But uh, <laughs> in God's infinite wisdom, I've had me back in the form of Sponsie. So uh, sure, Annie's like laughing her way. But um, you know, this is the kind of like sickness that I had. You know, but um, eventually, um, you know, I was able to actually listen to that tape and not fall asleep. And I started to practice what that had. And um, I started to feel a little less twitchy. This stuff works. And it was before I was up to this, but it didn't matter. She was like, if it's, if it's in 10, 11, and 12, you can start with it now. You can keep improving at any time in your recovery. You'll get up there in its, in its rightful term, but you can start now. And, um, you know, little by slowly, I got introduced to other things to do. And uh, I haven't necessarily, for, you know, needed to listen to a tape or read a book at this point. Now I follow my own path and my own relationship. And, uh, and I like to talk to people about what they're doing because I get ideas. And uh, sometimes uh, somebody will say something very poignant at a meeting, and I'll use that in my next meditation. There's a lot of opportunity for, the, for me to get meditation material. Uh, sometimes it doesn't come from AA. Well, we don't have the market cornered on God, so I have to keep an open mind. Um, there came a point uh, about five years ago, six years ago, something like that, where I found that my spiritual needs were not being met in alcoholics around me whether it was because of the rooms I was going to, the people I was sharing with, I just didn't feel as close as I wanted to. 
as I felt I could. Well, I found something that got me there. The book tells me that if I need other help, go to other places. I don't come here with a flat tire, you know, and I found a group of women in my church who support each other in prayer and meditation. I took a lifelong vow with them. And I have something with them that I would not have here. I don't care where the door opens. I'm going to go. If God's behind it, I want to be in there. You know, and I found out, you know, after a lot of searching that he's right within me. And it's just connecting to that. And sometimes I need other people's help with that. And sometimes I can do it on my own. But it doesn't matter. You know, sometimes I want to be alone with a friend, and sometimes I want all my friends together. You know, and just there's different times in different places. But I never want to stop talking to God. Even when I'm mad at him, i got to shake my fist at him. But I, I, the important thing is to not close the line of communication. Because when I do that, I'm living in the darkness, and I'm going to hurt myself and hurt other people. And I have a conscience today. When I hurt myself, it's not quite so bad as when I hurt other people. I can get over the hurt that I do to myself a lot quicker than I can get over the hurt that I did other people. And that's the exact opposite of how I used to live my life before AA, you know. If I hurt you, who cares? But if I hurt me, oh, we got to take care of this. You know, but, you know, it's, it's very different today. And uh, And I don't think I'm done on my journey. I think there's a lot more out there. And um, I think that, you know, each and every one of us, if we took the time to talk to one another, could teach each other something about connecting to that power. Something a little different. Something that might get you there a little sooner. And, and I think, uh, I know I've been guilty of this, but I think there's plenty of times in AA where we do a disservice to one another, where we, we're afraid to talk about how we practice our spiritual life and I think we uh, rob one another of opportunities you know so I try at least uh, with the people in my life to share what I'm doing uh, I don't share my belief in a higher power I don't think that's helpful to people I think that uh, we need to find our own path and especially new people coming up in the program uh, it's my responsibility to definitely not share with them my belief in a higher power I need to leave the door wide open for them. And if I share with them what I believe, they may think that's what they need to get AA, and I don't ever want to do that to somebody. So my higher power may not work for you. You need to find your own. But I can tell you how I connect to mine. That's what I can share with you. And what my connection has done for me. And I think that's, you know, incumbent upon me to do. And, uh, you know, again, the step is about knowledge of his will for us. The power to carry that out. As an alcoholic who's been blessed with recovery, I am recovered from my alcoholism. What God wants me to do is to pick up that message and carry it somewhere. Because it has no value if it stays with me. It's dead. It's a dead life. But if I share that with another human being and help them, then it has value. And that, that leads me, once again, very logically to the next step. It says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Not as the result of watching TV. Not as the result of a self-improvement class. Not as the result of don't drink and make meetings. As a result of these steps, we try to carry this message of the 12 steps to alcohol. And the fact that these principles in all our affairs. Well, we'd like to schluff that last part off. Thank you. <laughs> It's a lot because you just carry the message, you know? <laughs> Let me carry the message, you know? But carrying the message is very important. Um, I carry the message in how I live my life. It's not in what I tell you, it's in what I do. I was taught very early on in AA, this is not my saying, because you've heard it a hundred times, that I may be the only version of a big book that somebody ever meets. I represent Alcoholics Anonymous in every day life, every situation I'm in. Every time I show up to a function sober, I am representing Alcoholics Anonymous. Every time I show up to a function and not behave like a moron, 
I'm representing Alcoholics Anonymous. Unfortunately, when I show up like a moron, I'm also representing Alcoholics Anonymous. I need to think accordingly before I act. It's not just about me today. I could kill somebody with how I act. If people complaining about life, oh, yeah, life sucks. It only gets worse. Oh, oh life's a bitch, then you marry her. You know. And they, they decide finally they want help with their alcoholism. And they go, oh, I know somebody. Hey, oh, no, she's miserable. Nah, that can't work. I, mean, I, I can't go living like that. I could kill somebody. I have to carry this message everywhere I go. You know, when I first came into AA, I didn't have much of a message to carry. But I still had one to carry. I was counting days. And I was in free spirit. There's a surprise. We meet three nights a week. And chances are I'm going to be there. And I'm sitting at a table with Big Vinny. And some girl walks in. And he gives me the nod. She goes, uh, who's that girl? I don't know. I'm only here two weeks. You're here ten years. Oh, don't you know who she is? You know? So I would say that. He goes, oh, told her. I don't think I've seen her here before. Do you know that girl? I said, no, I told you I don't know her. He said, what do you think she's doing here? I said, what the hell do I know? Let's go over there and find out. What am I going to tell her? He goes, do you know where the meeting was for? Yeah. you know where the bathroom is? Yeah. You know where the coffee is? Do you know where the other ladies in the room are? Show her those things. <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't have much to give, but I gave it, you know. And uh, I introduced myself. And I told her I was there two weeks. I hadn't seen her here before. Have you, have you ever been to this group before? She said, oh, no, it's my first meeting. So I really don't know anything, but they told me to give you a meeting list to, to get you coffee. And I'm supposed to introduce you to every lady now, and I think you got to take their numbers. That's what they made me do. That's all I had. But I gave it freely, eventually. You know, it was just easier to give it to her than to listen to him, you know. So, But it taught me something. He didn't tell me to give her anything I didn't have. He said, what, did he, what do you have? Give it to her. And, and that's basically what I would suggest is that, the best way to carry this message is to give the message that's your experience, strength and hope, not the more. My opinion is valueless. I have no children. I, I don't make suggestions to people on how to raise children. I have no clue. My dog runs the house. I'm not going to tell you how to run a kid. I mean, you know, you got no business going there. Um, I, I try to be available to people in alcoholics and all that. If they have a day, two days, nine months, 22 years. Sometimes a person with 22 years needs the end of the day more than a person with one day. They're numb. They have no clue. All is well. They're not drinking. It's a guy who's been doing this for 22 years but doesn't have a message yet. He's just not drinking, going to meet and holding on. He's still white knuckling it. He's still got the mental obsession of a drink. That's the guy we need to help. You know, the fact that somebody happens to have not drank for a certain amount of time doesn't mean they're out of the need of help. I was taught that when I go to my home group, that I hang around the people I know. Look to see who you don't know. Go talk to them. That's what I need to do. I need to practice these principles wherever I go. I could talk up the sky and say, hey, if I go outside and yell at a cab driver, that's, you know, that's really not what this is about. Uh, I have to, I have to live the way I talk. And, uh, you know, some of that happens kind of in spite of us. I was coming to AA for a couple of years. And, uh, somebody, uh, personal friend of the family who, uh, I just, uh, we never, uh, enrolled in each other's fan clubs, shall we say? Uh, came into my home group one night, and my first thought was a little bit along the Bogart line. Of all the rooms in AA, why is she coming to mine? You know, that was my first thought. 
And then I said, she's at an EA meeting, go put your hand up. Start talking to her. I don't know that we'd ever enroll in each other's fan club, but um, she said to me, uh, yeah, well, you know, I saw how much you changed since you, you came here. I wanted to give this a shot. I'm thinking, well, I still don't like her too much. See? So I said to her, what do you mean, how much I changed? She goes, oh, you treat me so much better ever since you come in here. I don't like you anymore than when I first got here. This stuff really works. I learn things that, that go counter to my nature. I treat people differently. Unconsciously. Unconsciously. From the practice. From the practice of doing the right thing. It becomes a second nature. It doesn't always have to be going against the grain. I hear people say things well, my, you know, I can't help it, I'm an alcoholic. But then go drink, pal. You can help it. Through these steps, you can help it. How we, how we interact with other people can be helped. And if it's not helped, shame on you. Shame on me. And, uh, you know, I, I can talk till the cows come home about the, Just the, the total change in the nature of my relationships with people since I've put these steps in my life. I, I'm open with the people in my life. I don't have as many people in my life. But the people I have, I really have a relationship with. And uh, they know how I feel about them. They don't wonder, well, what did she mean by that? They know how I feel from what I say and, more importantly, from what I do. And that's what this is about. Whether, uh, you know, it's it's very easy for me to treat another alcoholic in the rooms of AA kindly. It's a little harder with, you know, brothers and sisters I know for 30 some odd years. It's a little harder. I was taught a lesson. Treat them with the same dignity and respect that you would a newcomer in AA. Well, that took it all away, didn't it? Boom. It's all gone. I mean, I've been given direct lessons for how to live this in my life. And uh, my life has been enriched, you know. And, uh, you know, we talked about it, you know. So, some of working with others takes away from other parts of our life, supposedly. It takes time from, you know, there's only so many hours in the day if I'm doing that. That's hours I can't be doing something else. I want to share something that happened to me recently. Uh, it was early December, and it was the first snow. And I had a commitment to speak at a detox that night. And I hate going to this detox. It's in the same hospital where uh, my brother died. I hate going there. It's like just brings back bad memories. I always try to, you know, when I hear they're asking for speakers from that detox, I don't go run into the front of the room. You know what I mean? So they ask me directly. I never say no, but I don't volunteer. All right? And I gotta go to this thing, I don't wanna go. But I'm gonna go because you gotta go. And I called the chairperson to tell him, you know, she was, oh, it's nasty out. If you don't wanna go, I understand. There is God. <laughs> and there is a God. And I said, don't be ridiculous, I'll be there. So they closed my office at one o'clock because it's snowing out. But I stay because I've got stuff to do, and it's around 5 o'clock, and the head of my company stuff, so I, he was, uh, yeah, I figured you'd be in here. So what do you mean? He says, uh, we closed hours ago. I said, well, what are you doing here? You know? And he says, well, and he goes, uh, you know, you, you've done a lot here, and, you know, we've been looking for this position, and at that night, he told me about my promotion, the recent promotion to my job. I'm on top of the world. I want to call my husband, but I can't. He works on the subway. can't find him. I want to tell my friends. Where am I going to be top? All right. I'm not going to tell them. What the hell would they care, you know? <laughs> so, oh, great. I'm excited about this great new thing in my life. Let me go to a detox. So I call. And I have never seen a more miserable-looking crew in my life. You know, but 
15 years ago, two of them I might have wanted to date, okay? <laughs> I got to be honest. You know, he would, you know, he's not that fan. You know, if he cleans up a little, you know, nice blue eyes. And I said, you sick puppy. <laughs> it's still there. You know, and, and I shared my experience, strength and hope, and, uh, and I'm looking at them. And I'm looking at me. I'm not, I don't have no styrofoam slippers on. I may not be looking that great, but I have no styrofoam clothes on. I'm going home tonight when I want to. I don't have to drink. I don't even want to. I'm afraid. But I'm them if I pick up one drink. And, uh, you know, had I told that woman my first answer, oh, yeah, it is miserable out, I'll take a rain check, I wouldn't have had that experience. I was not more grateful than when I walked out of that detox. I didn't even care about my promotion at that point. So I was grateful for the thing that mattered, that I have a life today. And uh, it was just a very poignant experience for me, and it's very recent, and I, I just wanted to share that. And uh, I'm sorry, I just... Uh, Look at my life. I got a great life. And, uh, I hope to God I never lose sight of that. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.